maybe things weren't so great for them when they were a kid. Maybe they weren't sure what was going to happen. Maybe they didn't have a lot of sense of goal. But one teacher, one principal, one educator gave them that hope, that confidence, that sense of their own self-worth. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a story where as one teacher started a young person on a very different road. And so many of the people we depend on right now in the middle of this crisis can look back to that one teacher, or maybe it was a group of teachers in their school who made all the difference. Now we're asking those very same people to achieve that same inspiration, have that same impact, but not be in the same classroom with the kids they serve. Imagine how difficult that is. Now, our teachers are tough. Our teachers are strong. The educators in New York City don't shirk from a challenge. And they're used to dealing with some of the toughest conditions in America. So when told you have a whole week to get ready and you're going to have to figure it out as you go along, they said, we're ready. Let's do it. And it's been inspiring to watch them. It's been inspiring to watch the parents, many of whom, again, have no experience trying to figure out how to support their kids with online learning, but they've put their heart and soul into it out of love of their children. How about the kids themselves? Let's note the heroism in our young people who are cooped up, going through so much, but they've applied themselves to online learning too. There's a big story to be told here about just how good the New York City public schools are, just how good our families are, our educators, our kids. And today we want to talk about how we move forward over the course of this school year and beyond and how we prepare for next year. I've already said next year is going to have to be the greatest school year in the history of New York City. And I'm not saying that as a flourish of words. I'm saying that because that has to be a sense of mission. We're going to have to do, starting in September, things we've never done before. We're going to have to help kids come into the year with an incredible sense of inspiration, incredible desire to make up for any lost ground, but also to overcome the pain they've been through. I have absolute faith in our educators and the leadership of our Department of Education. You'll hear from Chancellor Carranza today. I have absolute faith that we will achieve that mission. But I want to set that bar high right now and say that's going to have to be kind of a historic achievement, what we have to do this coming school year. But I know we're up to it. Now, everyone Everyone who serves our kids, principals, teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, the folks who work in food service, the crossing guards, the custodians, everybody who makes up the school community, there's so many more. Everyone's feeling this moment. Everyone's devoted to our kids, but everyone has that sense. Our kids are going through a lot right now. And I want to just make sure we're all sensitive to them. We're all thinking about them. Look. I think all of us can take ourselves back to when we were kids, especially those really confusing middle school years, all the challenges of high school. I think every high school student kind of has a self-doubt, a fear about the future and anxiety, not knowing if they're going to fit in, not knowing if they're going to succeed, loving all the good things about being young, but with that constant anxiety. Now, imagine you take that and you overlay a pandemic that creates so much more fear and confusion and anxiety about the future. I, I, I often reflect upon the experience I've had as a parent and what my kids went through and now what I even see from them as 20-somethings. This generation came up with a lot even before this pandemic. The, the, the kids who experienced the Great Recession and the aftermath, the, the kids who grown up in the shadow of global warming, they're a tough generation. They remind me of what my older relatives used to tell me about that experience they had growing up in the Depression. There's something that I see in this generation, too, and I wish they hadn't gone through all this before the pandemic, and I wish they weren't going through everything they're experiencing in the pandemic, but they are. And it's hurting them. It's, in some cases, traumatizing them. Some kids have already seen so much just in the last weeks, the losses in their own family, in their own schools. They're tough kids, New York City kids. And they're going to find a way through, but we have to be there for them. We really have to understand how much they've experienced, how much pain they're going through. Our job is to help them. 
help them with the mental health support and, and really that effort that all educators do, but it's going to have to be even greater now to raise up their self-esteem for the moments ahead, for the tough times ahead. But what is inspiring to me is even with that tough, tough backdrop, the fact that we have seen our educators rise to this occasion gives me a lot of hope. You know, when I talked about the online learning and everything we've had to create in these last weeks, um, this kind of gives definition to that analogy that's often used when they say building a plane while it's going down the runway. This is the ultimate example of that. But the plane's been being built week after week. More and more online learning working better and better. And the incredible adaptability of young people to figure out how to connect with it and make something of it. We're seeing it and it's given me a lot of hope, but we also know we have to respond to this moment, be smart about it, be flexible about it, understand the changes that are going on and how we deal with them. And that's why today we're announcing a new grading policy. Because we want to make sure the grading policy we use now fits the moment we're in now and the reality of our kids, our parents, our educators now. So the chancellor, his team uh, worked with Parents, teachers, elected officials, advocates listen to all different viewpoints. We've had a series of conversations confirming the direction of this policy. And it came down to the notion of what we owe our kids at this moment. First of all, flexibility. This is literally a once in a century crisis. And the pain it's inflicting on children and families has to be taken into account. There has to be a sense of flexibility in a moment like that. But there also has to be a reminder of our ultimate responsibility to our kids, to prepare them for the future, to make them as strong as they can be, to give them the best education we can. This is a moment, a horrible moment, a moment we'll remember all our lives, but remember our kids have decades and decades ahead. We have to prepare them for that. So we have to continue to have high expectations for them. We have to continue to take an approach that helps them be their best. That work continues, and it will even more going into the next school year. We have to do both. We have to understand the moment, be flexible about the moment, but also hold those high expectations. If we didn't do both, we would be doing a disservice to our children. So the policy is built with some important foundations. First of all, we must help our seniors graduate. Any senior who can graduate, we're going to help them get there. We have to keep our kids engaged. We have to keep improving distance learning, but also have them stick with it all the way up to the next school year to the maximum extent possible. We have to recognize that some kids are having a tougher time because of this crisis emotionally and academically. We have to help them catch up and use all the time between now and the next school year to do it. So that piece, that question of will kids be able to catch up, but that's on the minds of a lot of families. A lot of parents are very worried about that, so let's talk about that first because that's so important to address. Here's the bottom line. Every student's going to get the help they need. The school year as we know it is so different now because everything's virtual, so that also means we don't have to see the same boundaries we often did in the past. We're going to help students all the way through the spring, through the summer if they need it, into the fall. Some kids will not need a lot of help. Some kids will need a whole lot of help. Some kids in between. But whatever it is, we're going to find ways to continue education for kids who need it. Those who need the most support are going to get the most help, obviously. The seniors who need to graduate and are having trouble, that's our first priority. But there's also going to be a lot of kids in eighth grade, getting ready to go to high school. We want them to be ready. Anyone, any child who needs that extra help, we have not just May and June, we have July and August as well. We're going to use them to the maximum extent possible. possible. So let's talk about the different grade levels. In grades K to 5, this is such a crucial time, obviously, I'm a big believer in 3K and pre-K, but when we look at the times when we really start traditionally to grade kids, 
all of this from 3K, pre-K, K to 5 is all the foundation building, of course. So we want to take advantage every day and we want to give clear direction to our kids. So in light of the moment we're in now, instead of traditional grades, there'll be two grading standards for kids grade to five. Either they are meeting the standards or they need improvement. Very simple, straightforward. But even kids who need improvement, we're going to stick with them because we know we can get them to the point where they meet those standards. The chance will talk about more detail, but it will be an evaluation based on a lot of the same things that we normally would. School projects, assignments, writing entries, the same kind of things we would do in person. A lot of that can be done online as well. And any child who we need more time with, we're going to find ways to use the summer. We don't know what the summer holds. This is something I'll keep saying to you. There's things we do not know yet. We do know that we can use online learning all the time. So we'll have options for the summer for the kids who need that extra help. Middle school, well, middle school is an incredibly difficult time. In general, when there is no pandemic, middle school is a tough time. Every parent out there of a middle school child, you know what I'm talking about. So we want to make sure we reflect that reality and we work with those kids one-on-one, -on -one, get them where they need to be. Stand the grades there, again, instead of the traditional grades, we'll have three, meet standards, needs improvement, and course in progress. That's for a young person who particularly needs more time to finish the schoolwork before them. Again, not the same as in-person classroom instruction, but a lot of similarities. There's still class discussions that happen online. There's still presentations and assignments. There's still the kinds of tests that a teacher gives to their own classroom. All of that continues in one form or another, and that can be the basis for the evaluation. We're going to make sure those kids who go through so much get the help they need. We can carry that through the summer. We can carry that into the new school year in terms of knowing kids who might need extra help when everyone does come back together as well. High school, well, again, a time of so much hope, but so much confusion and anxiety in regular times, even more now. Kids are thinking about the future. That's what high school kids do. One eye to the future at all times. So the big question now is, you know, will the future happen on time? And the answer is yes. We're going to work with all of our high school kids, keep things moving forward, but with rigor, with real focus on quality and with support. So. In the high schools, we'll use the existing grade scales. It's the most pertinent level to continue the grading scales that we've had previously. The same range of things you're graded on, the written assignments, the term papers, the exams, the presentations, all that continues online. Teachers will be watching to see if young people have gotten where they need to go. But we want to offer an option, again, the flexibility given the moment. Any uh, high school student that's earned credit by completing a course, traditionally they would get a grade, one of the traditional grading structures. And that would go into their grade point average. And that would obviously have a lot to say about their future, including things like college admission. In this environment, we're giving young people an option in a high school level that Given the disruption that's occurred, and it's been different for each student, they have the option if they have completed a course, they're going to get the credit, but they have the option to choose, and this is for the, again, this half of the school year, not for the previous grading that happened earlier in the school year, but for this half of the school year. They can choose to have a passing grade rather than a specific grade in the traditional structure. If that's what they think makes more sense, and they have completed the coursework, and they have earned the credit, they have that option, rather than something they think might adversely affect their GPA because of aberrant circumstances. That's a choice for each young person. And if they need more time, there'll be a course in progress designation that allows them to keep working on that course into the summer, even beyond if they need for the seniors, of course, the focus is on graduation. And traditionally, there's been June graduation, but also a lot of seniors have finished in August. So we have more than one way to succeed here. 
We just want to make sure that every senior who can graduate does, and they'll get the most intense support of any students in our school system. So that gives you a sense of what we're trying to achieve. We're keeping standards in place. We're keeping a lot of continuity. But we're adding flexibility for this crisis. And our educators are smart. They're, I'm going to use a word we normally associate with business, but I've seen this with educators. They're entrepreneurial. They're creative. They'll figure out what makes sense for their classroom so long as they have clear standards to work from. And these will be consistent standards throughout the school system. Now, I just want to speak directly for a moment to our high school seniors and to their parents, their families. Uh, wasn't that long ago, I've got a 25-year-old and a 22-year-old, so it wasn't that long ago that uh, I was going through with my kids senior year in high school. What a powerful time. Again, a lot of confusion, a lot of doubt, but also a lot of hope and a moment of profound importance to the future. We're going to be there with you every step of the way. Can't do it some of the ways we used to do it, but we're going to be there for you. We need to foster your future. You are literally the future of New York City. You're our hope. We're going to be there for you. And we need to celebrate you. This disruption has been so intense, but that does not take away our belief in you and our sense of the human moment. This moment is so special to you as you approach graduation. We don't want you to lose that. So. Uh, every school will have its own approach, and every school will look for the opportunity to celebrate you for sure. And right now, that all means virtual, but maybe down the line, maybe we'll get lucky enough that some gatherings can start to occur. But here's what I will guarantee you. We're going to do one big citywide virtual graduation ceremony. We're going to do one big celebration of New York City's high school seniors. We're going to make it something very special. You may not have the traditional ceremony that you were looking forward to. We're going to give you something you will remember for the rest of your life and you will cherish. We're going to bring together some very special guests to celebrate you, to salute you the way you stuck with it, not just in the years before, but particularly during this crisis. And you know what's wonderful? Some of the people who will be the special stars of this gathering will be graduates themselves of the New York City Public Schools. That's an extraordinary roster of talented people who make an amazing impact, not just on this city, but on the nation and the whole world. They're going to celebrate you and remind you of the greatness of the students who come out of the New York City Public Schools. You're going to have a day of inspiration and support and celebration, no matter what this pandemic has thrown at us. We'll have details announced in the weeks ahead, but expect it to be something very special, very memorable, and all about appreciation for you. And family members, parents, that means you too. Because we all know, God bless our kids and the hard work they do, but every kid gets there because of the love and support of their family. So we're going to celebrate the parents and the family members as well. Now, before I conclude on schools, a um, big question has come up throughout the last few weeks. How could we make sure that every kid got what they needed, the technology they needed, to be able to participate in online learning? We were honest in the beginning. It, it wasn't in place. Kids didn't all have it. That's part of the digital divide. It's not good. It's not acceptable. It's something we need to fight. And I've talked about this horrible crisis also being a moment where we get to learn what's wrong that needs to be fixed and we will fix it going forward. But in the middle of this pain, there's been a chance to real, really deal a blow to the digital divide, really fight back against that divide, and put technology in the hands of lots of kids who have never had it. And so the iPad deliveries, the, you know, the, the latest, best iPads delivered directly to the homes of so many kids who didn't have access before. Uh, we said that for every single child, who we knew needed one, they would get that delivery by the end of April. And that is precisely what is happening. Right now, 247,000 iPads have either arrived at the homes of the students or in the process of being shipped to them as we speak. 247,000. That is many more students. And Chancellor, you'll remind us the exact number of students in the Houston school system, for example, but that's one of the places that 
The number of kids getting iPads in New York City through this initiative over the last few weeks is more than there are total students in the Houston school system. It's been a vast undertaking and it had to be created very, very rapidly to reach all these kids in time. It's happening. Now, we had an order for a bigger supply. That means there's some kids that still have not come forward and families not come forward. And I'm saying that with empathy. I want you to come forward. If you, for any reason, or if anyone in your life, anybody watching or listening, anybody in your life, a kid who needs that iPad, doesn't have that technology at home, needs that access, and still hasn't asked for it, all you got to do is pick up the phone and call 311. Or you can go to schools.nyc.gov, and we can ship it, have it to you in a matter of days. So we know there's still more kids who need them. We want to find those kids. We want to get them to them. And until the, you know, any, any child who still needs it, we're going to serve even if they call today, tomorrow, a week from now, we're going to get it to them. But what I'm so proud of our DOE team and all the folks who helped us in the private sector is we're approaching a quarter million kids who have gotten iPads in a matter of weeks, and that's tremendous. With the Internet service attached, this is how you fight the digital divide, and this is going to supercharge the online learning in the months ahead. Let me go to a few other topics. Well, one other topic, and then I want to go to our daily indicators. So small businesses. I have talked to so many people, small business owners, and people who love their neighborhood small businesses, and there are, there's so much concern for our small businesses right now. You know, it's going to be hard for everyone to make it through so we can restart our economy. And I'm sure bigger businesses are deeply challenged as well. But the brunt is being borne by small business. They don't have the reserves and the big apparatus and all the experts that they hire to help them navigate this. Small business is taking it on a chin. And we need to help them every step of the way. Now, look, I've said from the beginning that the city put together a loan and grant program, almost $50 million. That's being exhausted immediately. That's what we could do. But what we really needed was intensive federal support. And, and some has really come in the previous stimulus and in the action taken in the last few days in Washington as well. That's a good thing. We were all very distressed to see a lot of that money siphoned off by big businesses. And some of that is now being returned, so it can go to small and medium-sized businesses who really need it. But what we saw is, as good as it is that the federal government actually is stepping up and putting real money out there for small and medium-sized businesses, the way it's being done is creating a lot of problems. First, that those big businesses try to usurp it, but second, it's a first-come, first-served basis, and some businesses are much better positioned to take advantage of it than others. And the ones that need it the most, the ones that have the fewest resources, actually are getting boxed out. We cannot let that happen. So the Paycheck Protection Program, that money, we saw how quickly it was used up the first time around. Now there's another round. It came out of what was referred to as Stimulus 3.5. And the program is replenished and with serious money, $310 billion. And there's two particular heroes in this effort. One, our own Senator Chuck Schumer, who led the way and fought intensely on the Senate side. And then on the House side, the chair of the Small Business Committee for the House of Representatives, for the whole nation, is New York City's own Congress member, Nydia Velasquez. And she fought not only for all that money and to push back the usurping by big business and make sure it was reserved for the businesses that need it. But she also made sure that the process was much fairer to community-based businesses, to businesses that had fewer resources, to businesses that don't use big banks but use community credit unions and other sources of financing, to businesses and communities of color that have for a long time been denied access to credit. Uh, Senator Schumer, Congress member Velasquez, has really pushed to change this program to make it more about everyday small businesses and make it more fair for all. Now, everyone out there who is a small business owner or close to a small business owner, it's time to get you in the game and get you this support. You deserve this money. You've been hit so hard. We need to help you survive. So we want to make sure you get access to this federal money. It's first come, first serve. 
So you have to apply immediately. And the simple way to apply is the federal government website, SBA, Small Business Administration, sba.gov. sba.gov, that's where you apply. The application is certainly not the easiest in the world, but you gotta do it, you gotta do it quickly. Now, we're hearing from a lot of small businesses that it's tough to navigate that application. We are today putting together an initiative to help you immediately. In the next few hours, you'll be able to call 311 and get connected to sources of help, uh, experts who can help you navigate the application. This is something we're putting together quickly as we see this need. We're hearing it so deeply from small businesses. So we're going to get you some help, some facilitation. But the most important thing is to immediately start working on that application. So if you haven't yet, small business owners, go to sba.gov. Please immediately get that application. Get ready the information you need. And if you need some special help, call 311 this afternoon and beyond, and we'll be able to help you out. OK, it's time for our daily indicators. And again, what we've seen is over the whole course of almost two weeks now, definite and serious progress. Not the progress we ideally want, which is for all the indicators to go down steadily and in the same direction, but clearly progress. And that's getting us closer to the day when we can start to make some of the moves to open things up. But I've said it before. I'll keep saying it. We're going to be cautious. We're going to be careful. We'll be getting governed. We will be governed by the facts. And the facts have to get consistent for us to make some of those moves, and we're going to be very smart and cautious when we do it. Today, a good day. Not a perfectly good day, but definitely a good day. Uh, indicator one, daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID. That went down from 122 to 112. Daily, uh, excuse me, indicator two, daily number of people in ICUs across our public hospitals for suspected COVID-19. That went down from 766 to 745. Indicator three, percentage of people tested positive for COVID-19 citywide. That went down 29% to 27%. The only category that went up is in some ways the toughest category, the testing at the public health lab of some of the uh, folks dealing with the most illness. That went up by only about 1%. That's a good sign from 55% to 56%. So a very strong day. Further evidence that what you all are doing is working. Keep doing the social distancing. Keep doing the shelter in place. Stay at home. It's working. We're getting closer and closer to those days when we see steady downward trend every single day. And that's what we need. So. I'm going to just say one more thing to the kids in New York City, and then a few words in Spanish, and then I'm going to turn to our chancellor. So to every kid out there, every student, every young person, if you feel like you're going through a lot right now, guess what? We understand that you are. You're going through a hell of a lot. I feel bad for you. I do. Because you're being asked to shoulder a burden that, honestly, Young people haven't been asked to shoulder in a long, long time. You're being asked to make sense of this crisis in your own lives while going through everything else you go through as young people. It's a lot. Um, sometimes parents and family members you think may not understand everything you're going through. I'm sure that's true on one level, but we all try with all our might to appreciate everything you're grappling with. And we will be there for you. The, Times we're living in, they're literally unprecedented. There's nothing like this we can find a parallel for, certainly not in our memory. But what we know is we have to support you. The, the love we all feel for you has to come out as support and understanding. We have to express it as a real empathy for what you are going through. And so we're going to be there with you every step of the way. I have faith in you. I really do. I have spent the last six years going to New York City public schools. It's literally the most inspiring thing I do as part of my job as mayor is meet all of you and see how extraordinary you are. There's a bright, bright future ahead. We're going to have to fight our way through these months ahead, but there is a bright future ahead, and it is because of you. So thank you. A few words in Spanish. No hay nada más valioso 
que nuestros hijos. Y ellos han pasado por mucho en esta crisis. Con nuestro nuevo sistema de calificar a los estudiantes, reconocemos lo que han pasado, pero los desafiamos como siempre. Nuestros maestros y padres han sido heroicos y les vamos a seguir dando apoyo en las próximas semanas. With that, I have to say, um, one of the things that people may not remember well is at the time that I hired Richard Carranza to lead the largest school system in the country. He had just been a leader in Houston in the valiant, extraordinary effort to bring that city and that school system back after Hurricane Harvey. Again, an unprecedented disaster that afflicted one of the nation's biggest and greatest cities. And then as superintendent of the Houston schools, Richard Carranza was the man who had to innovate a whole new approach and speed up the process of bringing back education in a place that had been put back on its heels deeply. I was so impressed when I spoke to him about those, those tough days he went through and everyone in Houston went through because he had this clear spirit, this can-do attitude, this belief that any challenge could be overcome. It was unmistakable and it gave me a lot of hope thinking about what he would do as our chancellor. Lord knows I never expected him and everyone at the Department of Education to have to deal with a pandemic. But how telling uh, that this man had already brought his school system back previously in another place from another disaster and it was in his DNA to do so. So, Chancellor, what you have done, what your team has done has been pretty miraculous. And uh, I have great faith that we're gonna have a strong spring, a strong summer, and uh, outstanding, absolutely outstanding next school year with your leadership. Chancellor Richard Carranza. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, I am humbled to be here and honored to be here. Uh, and I wanna echo everything that you said about our students, about our teachers, our principals, and our families. Uh, but before I uh, say anything else, I wanna give, you know, I've spent uh, every week visiting our regional enrichment centers and seeing heroes in action. Our school safety agents, our student nutrition workers, our teachers, our administrators, really tending to the children of our first responders and our medical personnel in a very caring, loving, and trauma-informed um, way. Uh, it's been nothing short of miraculous. Uh, but I do wanna take a moment to thank the teachers who are teaching. The, the administrators that are supervising and clearing the way and clearing the obstacles for teachers to be able to do what they do and our parents at home. I have seen countless examples of incredibly innovative and enriching activities that our teachers are putting forward for our students. I've seen teachers engaging every single day with their students, finding their students, making sure they're engaged. So I want to say to all the teachers out there and all the principals, thank you. Uh, one of the fallacies that we often hear is that we've been out of school for a number of weeks. Well, I want to be very clear that school has been in session. We have never stopped being in session. What has changed is the manner in which we've engaged with our students. Instead of face-to-face, -face, in person, we are doing it remotely, which is why we say this is remote learning. So to all of our teachers and administrators that are on the front lines, I want to say thank you to you as well. You also are the heroes that are continuing to keep our students engaged. Uh, so thank you. Uh, what we're announcing today is a result of a tremendous amount of collaboration and discussion. Uh, and on this particular topic, um, the opinions and ideas are vast and wide. On one end, there is the notion that nothing should change. Uh, we should continue to have everything as it was prior to COVID-19. Uh, that accountability is important. On the other end is, listen, it's a traumatic event. Uh, we've never gone through this, so everybody passes, everybody uh, gets, uh, gets an A, everybody just moves forward. And everything in between, uh, we've heard all of those comments. 
But at the end of the day, Mr. Mayor, you and I have the responsibility. You and I have the accountability of having a policy that will not inadvertently harm students when they decide to do the next thing in their careers, whether it's going to college, whether it's a scholarship, whether it's a career. So we have to craft the policy that recognizes the trauma, that recognizes the voice, that recognizes what our students in our community have been through, yet still provides for a path forward for our students, given the fact that we've never stopped being in session. So the policy we're introducing takes into account all the feedback that we've received. Uh, we've heard from students, parents, principals, teachers. Uh, we've heard from professors. We've heard from elected officials. We've taken all of that input into consideration with a policy, but we've remained focused on keeping our students learning while taking this into account in this new reality. Uh, Mr. Mayor, as you said, we've developed a policy that keeps our students on track, especially our seniors who are about to graduate. And I want to thank you for the commitment of this city to recognize and celebrate our seniors. Uh, we will celebrate you. Uh, it may not be in the manner that you thought, and we know that there are a number of schools that are thinking about what they're going to do as well. We're going to support them as well, but we want to make sure that you know we're proud of you. This policy also accounts for the extra support that students are going to need and, and helps us to identify those students that are going to need those extra supports. I fully stand behind this policy. I think it's an elegant way to thread the needle of keeping students engaged while still recognizing that our community has suffered trauma. Remember that this is about recognizing the needs and the strengths of our students as we go forward. This policy also recognizes that an enormous number of our students are bringing the acute trauma they've suffered that COVID-19 crisis has wrought for them, their families, and for the city. It also takes the current environment into account when assessing students and ensuring that we have a uniform, equitable system across the board. The number one thing that I've heard from every stakeholder that I've engaged with is we need something that is citywide and that is standard. It maintains our standards and requires students to complete the work, but recognizes as well that we as educators, we as a system, an educational system, must be flexible in, a, in, in how we go about that work. Our teachers, as you've mentioned, Mr. Mayor, are, are experts in meeting students where they are and responding to differentiated levels, but they need to know and they need to have the information at their fingertips to be able to make those assessments. We're providing and we will continue to provide, but with this new policy, we will provide guidance specifically to schools immediately. And if you're a parent or guardian with questions, don't hesitate to ask. We're here to walk you through this and we're here to support you every step of the way. The extent of this public health crisis has become clear that we need to close buildings. But it, and, it, and as you remember, Mr. Mayor, this was a very deeply painful but necessary decision. However, through all of the ups and downs, our families and school communities have remained resolute while tackling this tremendous undertaking. As always, we know that our students can rise to the occasion, but we've already seen our educators take this on uh, into the largest school system in America, entering our sixth week of remote learning where other school systems are starting today. So this is kudos to our educators who have made this heavy lift. And Mr. Mayor, I just want to clarify one data point you asked. With our uh, iPad distribution, we, we have now shipped 247,000 iPads, Wi-Fi equipped iPads. That's equivalent to the entire school system of Atlanta, Seattle, Detroit, and San Francisco combined is that number, 247,000 iPads. So we should be very proud of the work that we've done, but also understand that there's much more work to do. Well, you know your facts. <laughs> Thank you for it. Thank you for that update very much, Chancellor. Okay, we're going to turn to our colleagues in the media, and please remember to give me the name and the outlet of each journalist, and here we go. Just a quick reminder to folks that in addition to having Chancellor Carranza in the Blue Room, we also have Dr. Barbeau and Commissioner Banks on the phone, and Juliet from 1010 Winds is up first. Juliet? Uh, yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Chancellor. How are you? Good, Juliet. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. So I actually have a, a two-part question for you regarding the education issue. Um, there had been 
about 300 parents on a Zoom meeting, uh, I believe yesterday or last night, that were opposed to this uh, proposal that you're making, the announcement that you're making. And uh, they are or supportive of this uh, measure that would allow the lowest grade to be dropped so that students can still receive a grade for you know, three quarters of the work that they did during the year. So that's uh, proposal question number one. Number two is how are you dealing with, will, or will snow days exist at all for this school year? How, how, how are you working or coordinating that? Hey, Juliet, help me just understand that question a little bit better. What, what are you saying with that second part? Oh, about snow days. Are they going to exist anymore or do you account for them at all? Well, I, I'm trying to understand. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, get that. I mean, the, the notion for the future certainly exists, but I think the question here has always been, you know, once you broke out, and it was horrible to have to do this, but once we broke out of the traditional model of kids going to a school building, uh, you know, everything changed. So, you know, if you had physical schools the way they were, something like a snow day would be an issue, but everything like that has now been subsumed by distance learning. When we come back in the future, we'll resume the focus on education in school buildings. And, you know, for next school year, the concept of, school, of snow days and all will exist. Hopefully we won't have the snow to go with it, but it'll exist. But to the first point, um, you know, I'll pass to the chancellor, but just say, remember that the, the work done in the first half of the school year happened and is in the books. And what we're talking about really is the second half of the school year, which got disrupted very early on. The kids came back just weeks before, you know, for the, for the second half of the year, they came back just weeks before uh, this all happened. And so this is about really acknowledging how disruptive this all was for kids and how it makes it really hard to uh, just do what we were doing before with no modification. It was smart to add some flexibility. But that does not affect everything that was in the books previously. Chancellor? Yes, so we, we've actually taken into consideration that particular question. It's important, as the mayor has mentioned, to recognize that three quarters of this school year were, were in the books when we adjourned to remote learning. So teachers do have an academic record of students. At the high school level, which is, which is what I read into this question because it's much more germane at the high school level, uh, there is a provision which is aligned to what CUNY does, which allows students at the end of this marking period, uh, first of all, a student won't get a final grade that is lower than any of the grades they got in any one of the marking periods this year. That's a safety net for our students. But secondly, uh, once a student is uh, ready for uh, a letter grade, the student and family will have the option of either taking the letter grade or instead opting for a pass. Now the difference is, is that if the student chooses to keep the letter grade, that gets factored into the grade point average, the GPA. But if the student opts to take a pass, then it does not impact the GPA. It just shows credit has been earned. So it's another flexibility and flexible flexibility point that we've built into this grading policy that again recognizes the trauma. It's aligned to state education department regulations uh, and it's aligned to what CUNY does as well. So again, trying to make sure our students are being well served while providing the maximum amount of flexibility that's possible. Katie from the Wall Street Journal is up next. Katie. Hey, good morning. Um, I have a two part question. And it's uh, focused on, you know, the students who have an alternate assessment who have school year round, if there's any plan to update that program, uh, and, and I guess it will continue remotely. And then additionally, what is the DOE working on um, to provide that additional needed support for students who, who may need it, who may be missed a lot of remote learning, whether it's in September or will they be allowed to kind of enroll in summer school when maybe they wouldn't um, usually have enrolled? And let me uh, just preference preface what the chancellor will answer to both those questions by saying we are working through the shape of summer as we speak. We'll have more to say on that soon in terms of what summer learning options there will be. We all understand that summer uh, and what summer is going to look like in the atmosphere of this crisis is a big open question. Um, but what, we is, what is not an open question is that the DOE will have more than one 
uh, contingency ready for how we're going to support kids online at minimum. Uh, and so I want to be very clear that, you know, when the day comes when we're going to flesh that out and show the exact nature of that, we will present it. But as we speak, different elements of a summer plan are being put together by the DOE. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So really good question, uh, questions. So the grading policy and the flexibilities will, will apply to all students, including students that have alternate assessments. Uh, as we know, students that have alternate assessments have individual education plans, IEPs. So that is being noted in their IEPs and there's outreach to parents uh, because parents have a voice in what that IEP looks like. That started on day one when we went into remote learning that continues to this day. Uh, and again, the focus here is to provide the maximum flexibility to students and to parents that recognizes the traumatic events that we're currently in. It also applies to our students that are immigrant students, students that are multilingual learners. So any subgroup of student that you can think of, uh, our schools, our teachers, our administrators are focused on making sure that they're being served uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, just to add to what the mayor said about summer school, there are multiple scenarios that we are uh, modeling and working through about what summer school will look like. Obviously, the, the medical uh, advice and what it looks like in terms of this virus in the community is going to have a big role to play in what summer school can or will look like. What is absolutely clear, though, is that this grading policy will give us the opportunity to identify students that need additional support, that need additional enrichment, that need additional time, and then provide them the time to be able to actually complete. The goal here is not to fail students. Uh, I can't think of any educator that would say, I want to be a teacher because I want to fail students. The goal is to have students master the subject matter. That's always been the goal. So if some students need more time, this is a perfect opportunity to actually create that system where students get that time. Henry from Bloomberg is up next. Henry. Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, there's a report in uh, Yahoo News that says that the federal government is going to support the city in a massive antibody testing program. And uh, I'd like to know whether or not this report is accurate. And if it is, how many tests are going to be conducted? When will it start? Uh, who will be tested? And what's the intent of this program? So, uh, Henry, there's been a number of discussions with the federal government on the question of testing, to say the least. I have had the conversation about testing with the president and the vice president and a whole range of the key health officials in the federal government. Uh, so this has been going on for weeks on one level. We are trying to figure out how we can do more testing of every kind, antibody testing, which you know, I've been clear um, and our health leadership has been clear, brings some real virtues, obviously has to be done the right way and has to be done with the qualification that it isn't a perfect answer. But, uh, and of course, the PCR testing, uh, that will be the backbone of what we need to do with testing and tracing. And that's really the central strategy going forward. We need federal help to do all of the above. So we have been in real conversations about how to do that and how to expand it. My hope is we'll have something more tangible to say in the next few days. Uh, but uh, the fact is, as with all things federal, it's been a kind of uneven situation. I'd like to get clear answers so that we can present them to the people in New York City. And I'd like to see a lot of federal support uh, for testing here in the city. As soon as we have something that is ready to go, we're certainly going to announce it. Next up is Marsha from CBS2. Marsha. Mayor, how are you doing today? Good, Marsha. How are you? Good. I'd like to talk to you about the, the homeless on the subways. Um, it's, I have multi-part questions, but they're all related. I, the, the fact that you've announced this new program, are you now accepting responsibility for getting the homeless off the subways? And since the NYPD uh, flooded uh, the end of line station at the World Trade Center today with cops and workers, are you planning to do it at the other end of line stations? There are 38 total. I know you're focusing on 10. 
And I just also were, was wondering, since you've whacked about a billion dollars out of your affordable hose, housing plan over the next uh, two years, will that adversely affect uh, the number of homeless in the city because there'll be less uh, places for them to live? Thank you, Marsha. I appreciate those questions. The last piece, um, I don't think, I mean, look, we're all pained that we've had um, the largest affordable housing program in the history of New York City. It's been an incredible success, and I want to tip my cap to everyone uh, who has been a part of it from day one, um, creating such an aggressive affordable housing program, and then it's been consistently ahead of schedule and on budget. It's been amazing. Um, it's sad to have to uh, delay some of that. It's very sad, but that is the budgetary reality we're dealing with. And of all the things we had to deal with in the immediate term, uh, that was something that we decided we, we would just grudgingly have to make a tough choice on, but it will continue unquestionably. Marsha, in that piece, I would say, it, it, like everything, the more affordable housing the better off you're always going to be in terms of fighting homelessness because the shape of homelessness today in terms of shelter homelessness is more and more as we've talked about it's it's families it's families who found economic struggles not because of mental health or, or substance abuse but as an economic problem end up in shelter the more affordable housing you build the more you can address the shelter homeless reality unquestionably but when it comes to street homelessness which is a, a painful, painful program, problem, but a very painful and historic problem in this city, but it is a much smaller problem. It's a, a few thousand people. That has always been about, you know, uh, the outreach efforts in recent years, uh, the Homestead effort, the, the um, safe havens that we've talked about a lot, those smaller places that we bring people in to try and get them off the street and keep them off the street. The supportive housing, which is affordable housing specifically for people who have mental health challenges and other challenges and need social services in the place they live. That work all continues. Uh, in fact, we announced yesterday that additional safe haven uh, space and affordable housing space for homeless people is being brought online right now. So I would separate the two pieces, Marcia, and say the, the pieces that are most focused on the homeless are continuing unabated the larger um, reality of our affordable housing plan. Some of it's unfortunately going to have to be delayed. But here's why I remind you, and Marsha, I know we talked about this back around the holidays, that journey home vision of getting uh, street homeless people off the street, those who have been on the street a year, two years, three years, four years. We believe we can consistently get more and more of them off the street. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with the Homestead Initiative. Now we're going to build it out. And even in this crisis, I spoke to Commissioner Banks about this in the last couple of days, Marsha. We've seen a number of street homeless, permanently homeless folks come in and accept those safe haven placements. And we want to do a lot more of that. So that work does not stop now. Now, on the question of who's responsible for homelessness in the subways, it's like other questions I've been asked lately. We're all responsible. It's all of our jobs to get this done. The state runs the MTA, clearly. Uh, the state has a whole lot of the pieces to the puzzle here. All the employees of the MTA who we need to help in this effort in a variety of ways. We need to be the eyes and ears. The MTA police, there's lots of pieces to the equation that are run by the state. But the city has a big piece of this too because we have the NYPD as the primary element of safety in the subways. Also, the NYPD doing more and more work in recent years on homeless outreach and teaming up with social services, with healthcare providers to do more to help homeless people get into shelter. NYPD has been outstanding. And of course, social services, all the organizations that do outreach that are part of the city's uh, efforts, all the nonprofits. I see this as a big team effort and a joint responsibility. What we announced yesterday is more places to bring homeless folks from the subway or the street to get them off the street out of the subway permanently. And what we announced is a vision that we need the MTA to help us with. We'll do our share. We'll devote the police resources. We'll devote the outreach workers. We'll do whatever it takes. But we need the MTA to agree to this plan. It's a common sense plan, Marsha. Here's how it goes. We got 10 key stations. They're the endpoints of subway lines. 
That's where we have a particular problem. We all know for decades there have been homeless people in the subways going from one end of a line, back again, back again, all night long. That needs to stop. The way to stop that is to support those people and help them come in and accept housing, but also to disrupt the pattern. The way to disrupt the pattern is between midnight and 5 a.m., close those stations. Deep clean those stations, which is good for everyone in this moment. Have a shuttle bus that takes any customers who need to get on the subway, take some one stop up to the next station. So literally, you're talking about between midnight and 5 a.m. in a subway system that's got a small fraction of the number of strap hangers it normally would have. So that can be done with shuttle buses. We'll help get that done too. But deep clean the stations, and everyone has to get out of the stations. Instead of what's happened for years and years, that a homeless person just sits there on the train, or maybe gets off the train temporarily, gets right back on it, goes then the whole way back. We want to create a change where everyone gets out of the station. Our uh, homeless outreach workers are there to engage and get people support, take them right away if they're ready to come in to a safe haven. NYPD is there to assist and make sure that we get the help to people they need. This would be a game changer, Marsha. We just need the, M the MTA to say, yes, it's not hard. They just need to say yes to this innovation and we'll do our share and then some. I'm going to tell you the stations just so everyone hears them. It's Coney Island, Still Avenue on the DNF, Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn College on the 2 and 5, Jamaica 179th Street on the F train, Jamaica Center, Parsons Archer on the E, World Trade Center on the E, 96th Street, 2nd Avenue on the Q, Pelham Bay Park on the 6, Van Cortland Park, 242nd Street on the 1 train, Wakefield, 241st Street on the 2 and 5, and Woodlawn on the 4 train. The MTA just has to say yes, and we can together do something really important to reduce the number of homeless people in the subways and get them the help they need. So asking the MTA to join us in that effort, and let's get to work on it together. Shant from the Daily News is up next. Shant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I gather that homelessness on the subways is just one piece of uh, commuters' reservations about using the subways during coronavirus. Um, there's still a lot of concern about packing close together. I'm wondering what else you can tell New Yorkers to potentially reassure them uh, once the subway, once this, the city reopens, that the subways are safe. On a completely different note, um, graduation traditionally being a time when seniors might indulge in pranks. What would you say to seniors uh, who might be contemplating that and they want to blow off some steam? Well, Shant, obviously uh, we were all young once and uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, that moment, uh, it's a jubilant moment when you graduate. Um, but I, I don't, I, maybe I'm missing some of the mood, but I don't think so. I, I don't get the feeling that young people are thinking about pranks right now. I, I think everyone's pretty sober by this moment. I've watched carefully as I've gone all over the city, talked to so many people who are you know, deeply engaged in their communities. I'm not getting the impression so far that young people have somehow missed um, what a difficult moment this is. I think they're, you know, they hate being cooped up at home. I think when they go out in parks and all, they, they still have a tendency to want to gather together. That's all understandable, and we got to keep helping them understand for their safety and their family. That doesn't make sense, but I'm not getting the sense of pranks being on people's minds, but it's something we'll certainly keep an eye on. And I think the message would be, hey, you know, anything that might be upsetting to people or, or can, you know, hurtful to people at this moment, people going through a lot, it's probably not a great time for most of the things we would have thought were pranks in the past. Um, on the question of the subways, look, Sean, I think this is going to be a step-by-step -step thing. Uh, we're going to be real clear about these indicators that I go over when it's time to do a little more and then a little more and a little more, but we're going to be cautious. And I think that's what the people believe is right at this point, to be careful and smart and really go by the numbers, which means I don't expect uh, subway ridership to turn on suddenly. I expect it to be, you know, sort of slow and steady in stages. I think people are going to have to feel their way, and I think some people are going to be more ready to go back to the subways. Others are going to take their time. Eventually, I believe, you know, we're New Yorkers. We're all going to come back to the subways over time. But it'll be in direct connection to a couple of things. How much progress we're making overall on the disease, I think, will be the single biggest determinant. 
um, what is done to keep showing that the subways are being cleaned regularly and um, that there's a real sensitivity to the health realities. You know, and I think people just having a sense that when they weigh the options, it's the one that makes sense for them in their lives. New Yorkers are very resilient. And I think at first, even someone might be hesitant over time. The convenience of the subways, the fact it's part of our culture, will bring people back. But, you know, I think we have to do it in stages. I think that's the smart way to go. Yoav from the city is up next. Yoav. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to ask you about underground yeshivas. Um, there's, there's been recent reports that the efforts are more organized and, and not perhaps uh, rogue operations um, as initially uh, thought. So I wanted to ask you um, how you guys are investigating these complaints and also what, what the protocol is because we've heard in one case the NYPD was investigating, but in another we heard uh, that City Hall responded directly to someone's complaint. So yeah, just how, how are you guys investigating it? And what's the latest you're hearing? Because initially City Hall kind of dismissed it as, as these kind of rogue teaching operations. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I don't remember anyone dismissing any gathering, honestly. Um, I think we were very, very clear. As you know, I've talked about it publicly. Weeks and weeks ago, I had a, a conference call with key Jewish leaders around the city, and there was tremendous support on that call for shutting down. And, and it was painful, obviously, for people, but for shutting down shuls, shutting down all sorts of uh, community gatherings. And I think the leadership of the Jewish community, the rabbinical leadership, have been absolutely united in saying all of that has to change. And I've seen a whole lot of adherence to that. Um, the, when we saw some specific complaints about which was identified from the beginning as a very small number of people who were trying to create services, some in their actual synagogues, smaller synagogues, some in homes. We made very clear, I made very clear, and my whole team has, that's unacceptable. And the NYPD was ready to enforce, and in a few cases had to enforce, but there wasn't much that I heard of uh, that needed enforcement in the end. I put the yeshivas in the exact same category, and for any faith, any background, any gathering, no gatherings. We're not allowing gatherings now. So uh, I'm going to say it to you, Yoav, I'm going to say it to all your colleagues. Someone give me an address. Uh, we had a, a point the other day raised by one of your colleagues uh, from one of the Jewish publications, and I said to him, give me an address of the problem. He gave me an address right there. We sent NYPD out to address the problem immediately and to make clear it's unacceptable. So if anyone knows of an, I, I don't know of a specific address of an underground yeshiva. If anyone sees it, knows about it, and tell, you can call 311, you can tell the city hall team, you can tell the NYPD, it's one common approach. It will be shut down, period. Alex from Chalkbeat is up next. Alex. Mr. Mayor, how are you? Good, Alex. How are you doing? Good. Um, I have two questions. One is just whether you guys can explain a little bit more what you mean by in progress, um, like how that will be determined. And like if you're a student who is just getting an iPad this week, like are you just automatically going to get an in progress grade? Um, and my second question is about screening given that um, obviously grades this year are going to be very different um, and attendance is not going to be considered in middle and high school admissions, like what you're going to tell schools in terms of how they can screen students or whether they will be allowed to screen students. Go ahead, Chancellor. So um, on the question of uh, screening and the grades, the mayor and I have been very clear that we will not penalize students in any way, shape, or form because of circumstances out of their control. Uh, a pandemic is certainly a circumstance out of their control. We've already said uh, with attendance, so uh, concomitantly with now the grading policy, we will be, bring, we will be putting forth some guidance in the coming weeks uh, around what that will look like in terms of the screening and admissions process as well. Um, as, as it pertains to uh, in-progress uh, classification, that is being used for students 
uh, where there's just not enough information for teachers to assess where are they. Have they met the, the, the standard or have they not yet met the standard? So in progress connotes uh, to the system and to us that these are the students that we particularly have to engage in a rigorous assessment protocol to assess where are they, what do they need. It could be a number of things. It could be the fact that they in fact did not have access to the technology. It could also be that they did have the technology but were dealing with a number of uh, family members or, that were sick it could be that uh, some of these students, especially older students, were essential workers in grocery stores. Uh, so there's a whole myriad of things that could affect uh, a teacher not having enough information to make an assessment of that student's academic progress. In progress is something that gives us a, not only a marker, but it gives the teacher the ability to say, uh, we need to do a deeper dive with this particular student. Sydney from the Advance is up next. Sydney. Mr. Mayor, um, last week I asked you why you weren't including the entire borough of Staten Island and private hospitals in your um, ICU indicator portion of your daily count. I wanted to see if you might consider, you know, moving forward, at least adding Staten Island's private hospitals to that count so that the ICU projections from all of the five boroughs are represented. Um, and if you can just a little, elaborate a little bit more on why you aren't including um, the ICU count from private hospitals, have you tried to do so? or have you not tried at all? And I have another question about the ferry. Um, my paper reported that NYC Ferry will retain all existing funding and not receive a budget cut or a fair change while the Staten Island's ferry's budget was cut in your fiscal 2021 um, budget. Wondering why the Staten Island Ferry's budget was cut and not NYC Ferry's. And do you anticipate Staten Island's new fast ferry route will still be able to launch this year given you know the financial uncertainty the city is facing right now? Okay, on the ferry, um, one, there will be cuts to NYC Ferry, and that will certainly be reflected in the next stage of the budget process. Um, two, and I, obviously it's never fun to talk about any cuts, but uh, everything that uh, has to be cut will be cut as we deal with more and more challenges. Uh, two, uh, we're certainly trying to figure out the, the next stages that had been scheduled for the ferry uh, expansion. Staten Island was a piece of that, Coney Island uh, in the Bronx. Uh, we're trying to figure out what's gonna happen with that now in light of everything going on. So we'll have more to say on that as well in the budget process between now and June. Uh, on the ICUs, uh, what I've said before is that the data related to the uh, health and hospitals, hospitals is the data that is most consistent and readily available to us for a daily tracking system. As Dr. Katz said, over the course of the last two months, we've seen very high levels of consistency between the data in the health and hospitals and what we're seeing in the rest of the hospital system. So health and hospitals is about 20% of all city hospitals uh, gives us a pretty clear view of what's happening throughout, but it's more readily available consistent data because 56 hospitals overall, very different systems, very different speeds with which we get their information. So this was about keeping our indicator system uh, going on a regular basis and consistent and informative. We'll check for sure, Sydney, to see if there's any dissonance when we factor in not just the Staten Island hospitals, but other hospitals around the city, if it tells us anything particularly different. But if not, I think you should not see this as an effort to give you a snapshot of what's happening in every hospital. This is a citywide indicator to decide how we're going to approach the restart and what point, which way. So long as we continue to see it as a consistent, accurate citywide indicator, that's what it's there for. Aaron from Politico is up next. Aaron. Mr. Mayor, um, uh, Marsha touched on part of my question, but with regards to the cut to, cuts to the affordable housing uh, program, do you know how many units uh, that is going to affect and why specifically were, you know, the cuts chosen to be made in, in this area? So, Aaron, we'll get you more detail today, and obviously we're going to be going through a lot of detail over the next few weeks as we go into the heart of the budget process culminating in the middle of June. 
But um, look, I, first of all, the, the larger vision around affordable housing remains intact. This is about slowing down some investments and postponing some things. It is not taking away the bigger vision. And it's a vision that I really, again, commend everyone from the very beginning of the administration to now who is part of creating and, and implementing the affordable housing plan because it's been extraordinarily consistent. And it's reached hundreds of thousands of people. And, and ultimately, as you know, uh, at its full extent, uh, will reach more than 700,000 New Yorkers. So it's an astounding initiative. It will keep going. But when you think about uh, the budget dynamics, we were dealing with uh, suddenly a massive budget gap. We were dealing with a cash flow crisis on top of that. Uh, Any time that you book a capital project, it has ramifications for the budget, obviously for the expense side of the budget too because of debt service. We had to slow down a lot of capital investments just to be able to make sure we could pay the bills now. And it's really, uh, it's a horrible situation. But that's what we have to do. But, but the plan is intact, and it will be implemented in the future. Again, the big question in the month of May will be the federal stimulus and what that will mean for everything we're doing. I spoke to Speaker Pelosi on Sunday, and we had a very good, detailed conversation. Uh, and I want to thank her for her amazing leadership. And the next stimulus bill will initiate in the House of Representatives. That's a very good thing for all the places that have been hurt so much by COVID-19 because I know the House of Representatives is listening to the reality of what we've been through. So the stimulus will really determine what we're going to have to do going forward. There'll be tough choices anyway you slice it, but the stimulus, if it actually takes into account what has happened here, all the costs, human and otherwise, that have been inflicted on New York City and all that's been lost, uh, and including first and foremost, the human loss, but then, of course, the horrible impact on the budget that's used to provide services to people. If it's really, really heard and understood and acted on, that stimulus could be a lifesaver for us. And if it's not, we're going to be in an even tougher situation. But that's going to then really govern everything else we have to decide in June. Gwen from Cranes is up next. Gwen. So real estate is a major part of the city. Can you, hey, you're really quiet. Yes, get close to the phone or? Yeah, there sorry about go. that. This there matter. you go. Great. Um, so good morning. Um, real estate is a major part of the city's tax base. What's your plan to reassure the commercial and residential property owners during a time when so many are calling for a rent strike? Uh, it's a good question. Look, I've said the answer lies primarily in Albany, and it's time for Albany to act. Um, Rent strike is not the answer, but relief for renters is the answer. So, one, I've called upon our rent guidelines board in the city. This is the piece we can do to ensure a rent freeze for the, you know, for the year ahead. Um, it's the right thing to do given what tenants have gone through, uh, the horrible economic situation we're in. Um, but the state has the power to take other actions, including most immediately to allow renters to pay their rent with a security deposit, which is the ultimate win-win. It helps the renters. It helps the landlords. Um, the state of New Jersey acted on this, and I commend them. Um, and I put out a tweet and said it is, uh, you know, as proud New Yorkers, uh, it's hard to get the words out of our mouths. You know, we're going to follow New Jersey on this one, but we really should follow New Jersey on this one. The state of New York should do what New Jersey did and give that opportunity to renters. And then beyond that, create a system that people have no money, and they'd have to be documented, but if you have no money to pay the rent, you should be allowed to forego it and pay it back later on. There should be a payment plan system. Um, and of course, uh, tightening up our anti-eviction rules to make sure uh, that there cannot be evictions now during the crisis and for 60 days after to protect people I think, uh, given that I know uh, landlords are going through a lot too, and again, the vast majority of landlords go about their business appropriately and fairly, they need, uh, of course, sources of income, but we can't ask you know, tenants who don't have any money. If they don't have any money, they don't have any money. It's not their fault. So for the tenants who can pay, great, keep paying on time. If you can't pay, you should have the option to use your security deposit. If you can't pay even after that, you should have the option to defer, but with a payment plan, so at least the landlords can plan on that. 
Last two, Jeff Mays from the New York Times. Jeff. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, the governor said uh, recently that he wished he had blown the bugle earlier about coronavirus and, and what was happening in Wuhan province. I'm wondering, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Do you uh, wish you had done anything earlier uh, in relation to uh, dealing with the pandemic that we're, we're experiencing right now? Jeff, um, look, I, I respect the question. I, I know your publication has already put a lot of energy into looking back, and I think it's, a, it's an important endeavor. And, I, and as a human being, I'll tell you, you know, of course I think about all the things that have happened in these weeks and months and think about what did we understand, all of us, what do we not understand, you know, what might have been different. But, but I will also tell you that um, right now, Honestly, uh, we've got lives to save right now. We've got uh, extraordinarily important decisions to make right now about the future, about how we protect people and how we bring this city forward and how we figure out the right kind of restart. I don't personally put a lot of time into dwelling on the past when I have people to serve right now and people to protect right now. I think there will be a time to really evaluate uh, everything and figure out what we can learn what it can tell us for the future, what we understood, what we didn't, what we did right, what we didn't. Those time, that time will clearly come. But I'll tell you one thing, and I appreciate, you know, the governor, I think, was speaking from the heart, and I appreciate that. I do know one thing. On, on January 24th, a group of us gathered at uh, emergency management, and were very clear about the fact that this virus was coming to New York City. And I remember vividly saying it was not a matter of if, but when and that the ability to protect the city hinged on testing and that if we could not get not only the physical tests but the authority from the federal government to perform our own tests, our city was in danger. Remember the weeks and weeks where we pleaded just to be able to do tests locally. Remember all that long stretch of time where every test had to be sent to Atlanta? I mean, when you look back, uh, there'll be plenty to discuss about everyone's role, but, but the, the central issue here the original sin here is the question of the federal government's role in testing, because we had a chance in this city to contain this had we been able to see it. We couldn't see it without testing. But again, we'll analyze, and every one of us, you know, if you're a human being with a heart and soul, you're thinking all the time, I'm certainly thinking all the time, you know, not only what was, but every single hour of the day, am I doing uh, the right thing with the information I have? Am I making the right choices for my people? And what I'm crystal clear about is it's about health and safety. That is what governs these choices. And, you know, I still, I still am frustrated that knowing that the best way to protect my people would be maximum testing, even this morning as I speak to you, I do not have the cooperation I need from the federal government to do that. So imagine January 24th, February, March, now almost all of April, asking the same exact question, making the same exact demand, and still we're not getting the help we need. That's the big story here, and, and we're not going to stop fighting until we get it. Last question goes to Gloria at New York One. Gloria? Thank you. I just wanted to see if it's, uh, I have two questions. If it was possible to get some clarity on the summer school aspect of this, I understand that you're still uh, working out how you're going to do summer school or if you're going to do it, but have you determined um, if how you're going, with the, my point being with the grades changing, how will you determine what students have to go to summer school? And then, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask about the subway um, announcement. Uh, some of the advocates have talked about uh, the fact that even though you have provided the 200 uh, additional uh, support beds, uh, the safe haven beds, um, the city isn't tapping into the hotel rooms that it could be providing for people and that there just isn't enough uh, being done to provide people a, a safe option to take shelter in, obviously with the shelters not being ideal right now um, with, the, uh, with the pandemic. So can you just talk about that? Yeah. Um, 
let's do this. Let me, let me start on the summer school, pass to the chancellor to add, and then I'll come back and finish up on the subway uh, question. Um, so on summer school, Gloria, the first thing I want to say is, it's, it's hard, I think, for all of us who are used to you know, a school building and a school year in the traditional sense. And so summer school, we all, you know, I think the thing a lot of us were used to is a relatively few kids needed that extra instruction and they went to summer school and they were usually not too happy about it. Um, but it was not what most kids experienced. Online learning has changed the whole reality. And it, there's a lot of things you cannot do as well on online learning to say the least. But, but one thing it is good for is it's very flexible and for kids who very sadly have to be indoors a lot of the day now, it's an option that they can go much more deeply into uh, and they can do it you know, at their own pace and all sorts of uh, good flexibility is there. And it's not just during the school hours, it's the evening, it's the weekend. The online learning really opens up a world of possibilities. So I think to think a little bit more as a, con a continuum than the kind of boundaries we experience with a regular uh, school year, school calendar. I can't wait till we have that regular school year and regular school calendar back because I think it's the most effective and the most human and the most engaging approach to education. But for now, we have the ability to reach kids in a lot of different ways. And I think you don't have this, you know, this is where I'll pass to Richard and say, I don't think it's that kind of binary, oh, these kids don't need summer school and you know, it's relatively few do need summer school. I think we have a much bigger set of kids who are gonna need some more help because the disruption that they went through, the trauma they went through, they didn't yet have the iPad, whatever it is, I think it's gonna stretch out the equation into the summer. So we don't know exactly what summer looks like and there's gonna be different options prepared. But I think one thing we can assume is a lot of kids are gonna engage summer learning. Some kids are gonna engage summer learning not because they're in a deficit, but because they don't have much else to do. And it might be a good time to learn more and you know, get ahead of things. I think we have to see it as more of a continuum than we usually do. Richard. Yeah, so adding to what you said, Mr. Mayor, I think that is absolutely on track. It's more of a continuum rather than the uh, compartmentalized way we've thought of school. You have semesters and you have summer and then you have fall and spring. Um, it, this is going to be much more of a continuum, uh, but perhaps to put this in context, uh, every grade level and every course at the secondary level, uh, there are standards. In other words, there, there is a body of knowledge that students must demonstrate mastery of to say they've completed the third grade, they've completed the sixth grade, etc. So the in-progress classification uh, as I've said, is really an indicator that the teacher is saying, I don't have enough evidence yet w of whether or not this student has actually mastered this body of knowledge. Now that's important because whatever the student has not mastered or whatever information the teacher does not have, then becomes the learning plan that students carry on through the summer. Uh, the difficulty that we've had in the past is that not having this kind of remote learning uh, ubiquitous across the system uh, and having and recognizing that there's been a technology gap um, and a technology divide, the opportunity we have during this pandemic is that we are closing that digital divide. We're closing that uh, technological divide. Our teachers, who I give tremendous credit to, have been building their capacity to be able to provide instruction, the pedagogy, in very different ways uh, than we did seven weeks ago. Uh, that's not gonna stop after uh, this pandemic is over. We wanna continue to build on that capacity so that we are, as the mayor has said, uh, providing students with opportunities 24 seven to continue to expand and continue to master the standards. That's gonna be the cornerstone of, that is the cornerstone of what we're planning for summer and what summer l learning looks like. The nuts and bolts about the who, what, when, and where, those are the models that we're working through uh, based on what the medical advice and the medical situation at the time is. Thank you, Richard. So, Gloria, to your other question. Okay. Um, first of all, the work we're doing to help the homeless, as I said, it, it was really not that long ago when you think about December when we announced the Journey Home Vision. This is the most audacious, uh, ambitious effort in the history of the city to end permanent street homelessness. And the reason we announced it then was that we had seen for three years 
progress in finally figuring out what it took to get someone off the street, how much work it took, but the fact that it could be done. And I, as I said, I was pleasantly surprised to hear from Commissioner Banks that even in the months of March and April, we've seen success getting people to come in off the street and stay off the street because of our amazing outreach workers. That effort is going to continue. But one of the things outreach workers always report back is they need more safe haven options. So that's part of what we're going to keep doing. And the 200 beds we announced is a crucial piece of the equation. The right safe haven bed in the right place is the way you get someone off the street. And if you make it stick, you get them the mental health services, the substance abuse services, whatever it is they need. In a lot of cases, that person never goes back to the streets again. That's what we're here to do. So this is crucial to the big equation. But to the other points you're raising, the shelter system now is being constantly reviewed to make sure that it is safe. Any time where we need to remove people from shelter, we will. And that's what we said. We will literally make as many hotel beds available as needed. Any shelter that needs more social distancing, has any challenge that requires more access to hotel beds, they will be there, period. And there's a constant review being done to make sure that any time that's needed, it's acted on right away. But what Commissioner Banks has said as well is that we've got to remember a lot of people who are in shelter need tremendous support. The coronavirus is one challenge, but a lot of them have serious mental health issues and other issues that require a support uh, structure in place. And not all of that can easily be transferred to a hotel. So we're trying to strike that balance, making sure we don't you know, solve one problem, create another problem, figure out what's the right number of people that should be in any shelter. And anybody, anything beyond that, those people go to hotels. So right now, we, we reached that mark we talked about of uh, 6,000 people who, 6,000 homeless folks in hotel settings. We're going to be adding another 1,000 this week going out of shelter into hotel. We will keep adding as needed to that number. But it's not like a, an abstract number. It's according to the medical needs of folks, the social distancing needs, and what's going to keep people safe the best. Is it to be moved to a hotel or to stay in a shelter, but in many cases just reducing the population in that shelter. So uh, bottom line is whatever it takes, we are going to do. We have no lack of hotel rooms. When we know we're doing the right thing to put someone in a hotel room, we're going to do it. Okay, let me uh, close this up today with just a point about, you know, where we started. Today was about what we owe our kids. Today was a day to recognize what our kids have gone through and how much we have to be there for them. Every adult with a child in your life, you know what I'm talking about. You're there for them all the time. Parents, aunts, uncles, guardians, grandparents, you know, so much of your life is being there for the children you love and all the people who take care of kids in all sorts of other settings as well, and, uh, people who, the guidance counselors and the folks in foster care and everyone who helps kids and of course our educators all feel that passion for protecting our children, helping our children. And we owe our kids real understanding and sensitivity and love in this moment they're going through. But we also have to think about what we owe this whole city right now. And I can tell you what I'm committed to and the whole team here at City Hall and in the city government. We're committed to protecting you. We're committed to making sure that the testing that we need, one way or another, we are gonna get this testing to happen in this city. We're gonna make sure that people are traced if someone tests positive. We're gonna make sure there are hotel rooms available for people who need to be isolated. We have an obligation to you to build the biggest testing and tracing apparatus this city's ever known, something never been done before, but we're gonna do it because that's what we do here in New York City. We create things that have never been seen before. And we're going to restart this city. We're gonna do it in a smart way, in a way that's based on the facts and the science, but we are going to restart. And the last thing I'll say is to remember why this city is the greatest city in the world. It's because of the people. The buildings are great. Love the buildings, the cultural institutions, that's wonderful. But it's you that makes this the greatest city in the world. Your strength, your resiliency, your creativity, your entrepreneurship, all of that is gonna be called upon now. So we 
We in leadership owe it to you to build the framework to keep you safe and bring us back. And also we owe it to you to unleash all that you do, all that you're capable of, because when all that energy and passion and ability and creativity comes to the fore, the city will come back, it will come back strong, and we'll even come back better because we're going to address some of the very contradictions that have been laid bare by this crisis. I don't have a question in my mind of the fact that this city is capable of a great and strong comeback. We're going to give you the foundation so you can paint that picture, build that story for the ages. Something great will happen in New York City and you will be a part of it and you will be the architects of it in the months to come. Thank you, everybody. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Thinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. In times of uncertainty... Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers... Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease, or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. everybody, I'm Vladimir Dutier, uh, along with Amory Green, who is broadcasting from her Philadelphia bureau. And I am, of course, 
am here in the CBS News Upper West Side Bureau. Uh, it's good to see all of you this morning. You were just listening to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. There's a lot to get to today, uh, including uh, news out of the White House, Anne-Marie, with regards to testing. Uh, we're going to talk to James Brown at some point, but uh, I guess we're beginning in Ohio. Yeah, we are going to start in Ohio. By the way, I like how you call it a bureau. It's so formal. Just a few weeks ago, it was the spare <laughs> bedroom where my mom slept. I know. You have a printer. So, yes, I'm really so that automatically makes it a bureau. The printer's sadly on the first floor, though. I'm getting some good thigh exercises going back and forth. Um, but yeah, what's happening in Ohio is actually really, really interesting. Ohio's holding their primary today, but the entire thing is going to be basically mail-in ballots. And what's interesting about Ohio is that this is a test case for perhaps future elections during the time of the coronavirus, maybe even an election in November. So we're going to bring in Jeremy Peltzer. He's joining us now. Jeremy, you are a reporter for Cleveland.com's Capital Letter. So talk to me about how it's working in Ohio. How are they doing mail-in ballots? And how are they able to pivot so quickly to mail-in? Well, Ohio's primary was initially March 17th, but because of, of course the coronavirus, they moved it back to today. Initially, the Secretary of State here, Frank LaRose, wanted to make it June 2nd, but state lawmakers thought otherwise. And it's, uh, as you said, an all-mail ballot election, and there's been some issues, uh, especially with the Postal Service. Uh, in the Toledo area, for instance, a lot of people aren't getting their ballots on time, or they're even their ballot applications. So overall, things are seem to be going uh, as planned, but there's a number of issues that people have had to work through. Uh, and we'll see by tonight how many of them are big problems and how many of them have been resolved. So uh, Ohio's Secretary of State said delays in mail deliveries have caused some Ohio voters to not receive their ballots, even though this is important, they requested them on time. Uh, is there any chance that the ballots won't be counted? There's a chance that the ballots won't be counted. Like first class mail, which takes about normally one to three days, is taking sometimes a week or more to, and voter ballot applications were due here on Saturday and ballots have to be postmarked by yesterday and to arrive and count. So as ballots come in, we're gonna see how many arrive on time and how many arrive late. It's already a low turnout election. It's the lowest, uh, I believe in Ohio since 2012. And it's uh, a pretty subdued election, especially with Bernie Sanders dropping out. So we'll see how many voters are actually participating in this election here. Yeah, it's so difficult to predict in this time just how things are going to turn out. But we sort of live based on polls and predictions. I mean, that's the way the system works. So I want to talk to you about what happened in 2016 and 2018 in Ohio. In 2016, in the uh, general election, it went red. In the gubernatorial election in 2018, it went red. What are Democrats doing to win back this state? Well, this year, there's no gubernatorial race on the ballot. There's, it's really only the presidential race and congressional races. And with congressional races looking to be locked up for either party, it's the presidential race. It's really the biggest game in town here in Ohio. And recent polls show that uh, Joe Biden is either ahead by a little bit or he's neck and neck with President Trump. And so uh, it's unlikely that uh, Democrats will pick up a whole lot of congressional or legislative seats, but they are hoping at least to make Ohio the swing state that it's traditionally been this year. Hmm. So, so there's a recent poll out that uh, founds, uh, finds rather that when it comes to uh, favorability in Ohio, Republican Governor Mike DeWine is well ahead of President Trump. It also shows the president is slightly ahead of Joe Biden. Has President Trump's coronavirus response impacted uh, his chances with Ohio voters? Well, that remains to be seen, especially with the economic fallout yet to be seen in both Ohio and around the country. Uh, that poll you reference shows that about 50% approve of how the president has handled coronavirus. But here, Governor Mike DeWine is getting 75, or I'm sorry, 85% approve of the job he's done. So as you said, he's running well ahead. Uh, that poll you reference is one of many to show both the president and Joe Biden neck and neck, essentially. And uh, we'll have to see how many people 
what people do in the coming weeks and the coming months, and also uh, what happens in the November election. There's enough problems here during the primary. We're not sure what November is going to look like. Officials say it's too, too soon to tell what November will look like. The battle, of course, will make a big difference as well. You know, in a way, um, those poll numbers don't surprise me that much because the president has really been sort of throwing a lot into the laps of the state. And so if the state, if the if the constituents feel like the state is doing a good job or their lives are not as bad as it could be in the midst of this coronavirus um, pandemic, then they're going to give credit to their state leader as opposed to the president. He's, he's been kind of going back and forth, and I'm, I'm sure part of what he wants to do is also take credit for the economy. Um, so let me ask you about the economy in Ohio. The unemployment rate jumped 5.5% uh, in March amid this uh, crisis. How does the economy rank in terms of issues for Ohio voters in November? Well, of course, the economy was the number one issue in Ohio even before the coronavirus. But now, I believe it's going to be an issue that's just going to sweep just about every other issue out of the water in Ohio and probably a lot of other states as well. We'll have to see what the fallout is. How many people will get their jobs back? Uh, will people continue to approve or disapprove of how the president's doing with his coronavirus response? The coming months, uh, a lot can happen. Nothing's decided yet. But the economy is going to be number one on people's minds. Number one, indeed, probably not just in Ohio, but across the country. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much. Thank you. Doctors in the UK are warning COVID-19 could be linked to a rare but serious illness in children. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Diane Hess, She's a pediatrician right here in New York City, and she joins us now to talk about this. Uh, so, doctor, what kind of symptoms uh, are these children showing? So I actually hadn't read this literature. It's not published yet in peer-reviewed journals. So I just read the article that you sent to me this morning. Um, what, I, what I was, what I could glean from that is that it's called, it's an illness called Kawasaki's disease, which is usually seen in children post-inflammatory. So it's like a child has. Um, some kind of flu or a viral infection, and then may, weeks to months later, they have this uh, reactive um, disease called Kawasaki's disease, which attacks the blood vessels of the of the heart. Um, it's it's not fatal; is very treatable. Um, and from what I took from this article, not all of the children tested positive for COVID that had the Kawasaki disease. So I'm not surprised because. Children who can get a common cold, which is often caused by coronavirus, the non-COVID-19, um, can get Kawasaki's disease. You can get it after flu. You can get it after multiple viral infections. Um, it's not fatal, and I'm not surprised. I think that um, what we're learning more and more is that COVID-19 can cause just about any symptom and attack any part of the body, but particularly the vasculature. It causes a lot of inflammation. Um, yeah, it's funny that you would bring that up because my daughter had a Kawasaki disease about three years ago, I think. And, you know, we spent a few days in the hospital um, while she was treated. But you're right, she's it's not fatal. And, she, you know, she's all fine and dandy and had to make sure that she got, you know, whatever shot she needed uh, in the year following. But I want to ask you about some new CDC uh, guidelines in terms of symptoms. They added uh, more symptoms, including chills and muscle pains onto their list. Are we seeing those in children as well? Uh, personally, I haven't. Um, we really, I, like I always say, we're in New York City. We're doing social distancing. We don't have that many COVID positive kids. I just got off of the Grand Rounds uh, for a New York Presbyterian where I'm affiliated with. Um, the children that we're seeing that are, have been critically ill have been children who already have been critically ill with either um, kidney transplant or heart transplant. There are kids who are already immunosuppressed in some way. Um, I'm not surprised that fever, and ch like fever, cough, chills, those are all symptoms of a flu-like illness. So why, they, to me, adding that to, to the list of symptoms is, uh, is a given. Those are all symptoms that you have when you have a flu-like illness. When you have fever, you have chills because your body is shaking and trying to break that fever and dispel that uh, high temperature. You know, it's interesting that you point that out, doctor, because I thought of that as well when I saw the new CDC uh, update with regards to those symptoms. Uh, to, to me, I, I would think that for the public at large, um, it would make more sense to uh, provide some guidance or information to the symptoms that are not common. In other words, for example, when I first heard 
from uh, our own Dr. Uh, John LaPook, he told me uh, something to bring real concern would be, for example, shortness of breath, which you don't normally um, uh, get with the flu. So I, I wonder why it's, you know, I guess it's confusing, I think, for the public when you come out with a list like we just showed and you just indicated, seems to be very flu-like symptoms, which they say if you have that, you should uh, consider, if you are able to, getting the test for COVID-19. I don't understand why they would just release a list of what sound like generic flu-like symptoms to me. Maybe the only reason I could think is maybe so we can get more testing done because um, if people, call, like I know in New York City, you have to call a hotline to get approved for a test. So if you call the hotline and you said, I had a fever of 100.4 and I don't have shortness of breath, they might say you don't qualify for a test. So now if you say I have shaking chills, you might qualify for the test and more people will be tested. I think that might be the reason, but otherwise I can't really see how much more fever and chills are going to bring into the picture because honestly right now, like I, I've said before, I think if a patient has symptoms of high fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, cough, we have to like, it's a great mimicker of all illnesses we have to be thinking of COVID. Um, you know, some of the colleges, including Harvard, are really sort of planning to open um, in September. Um, I'm wondering what advice you would give parents who are concerned about sending their kid off to school. Uh, I think it's too soon to tell right now because we have, I mean, look at this. This started yeah. like March 18th. Look how much has changed. Every, every week we get new guidelines. My guess is that this, the desk are going to be socially distanced, so maybe people will sit like every two desks or every three desks. And I think people, I think that people will be going back to school with masks on their face, kind of how they're doing in China right now. That's what I think. But um, mm. I do, I do think that um, young people need to be socialized. I think we're seeing as this progresses, we're seeing more and more um, anxiety and depression amongst teenagers and children, school age children. They're really. Uh, really lonely and they need education and some schools have knocked it you know knocked it out of the park with the online schooling and some schools really haven't and these kids need to learn um, I'm worried about their education I'm worried about kids who have to go to high school who've missed the last semester of eighth grade I'm worried about kids who have to go to college who've missed the last semester of high school if their school is not up to par not every school is created equal um, but I do think that um, if the numbers keep on falling like they are we will have a new norm and that we'll go to school probably with a mask on our face and social distancing. Because remember, we're also gonna have the flu in the fall. So you're gonna have another COVID spike and you're gonna have the flu. So uh, we're gonna have to be able to- What about care. temperature testing? Uh, I, I think if you can get a thermometer, it's, it's not a bad idea. I don't know how, um, I mean, like I, I've said this before in interviews, you know, the whole point of getting opening up the economy is getting parents back to work. So you need to get parents back to work, you need to get people back to school. Once you start temperature testing, I can tell you just in New York City for daycare, you know, they call every parent if a temperature is over 99 and we'll say, oh, you know, the parents will call me and I say, that's that's a temperature, that's not a fever, right? A fever is 100 point mm. over 100.4. So who's going to make that decision? Do you send home a kid with a 99? Do you make that parent leave work? So I think we're going to have to have really strict guidelines about what is a fever to send you home from school and are there other symptoms with it? And I think people, to be honest, I think teachers and schools are going to be freaking out. So they are going to send home the 99, which we see all the time on regular visits. A temperature of 99 is a temperature. It is not a fever. So I think it's going to be uh, tough. Doctor, I... I I'm curious about, uh, let's stick on this topic of schools. Uh, the President of the United States recently uh, said that uh, he was potentially uh, looking at certain governors uh, easing restrictions across the country, reopening economies, and mentioned schools as one possibility. Given that children can be asymptomatic um, and can potentially spread it to vulnerable populations, does it make sense? I, like, let's just use New York City as an example where we've been the epicenter uh, for uh, a good part of this pandemic. I mean, would it make sense to open schools? Understanding, of course, and, I, and I've said this, that you know, in addition to doctors and medical professionals like yourself and essential workers who are uh, conducting themselves heroically, parents too who are finding themselves becoming teachers at home, becoming IT specialists, becoming chefs, all the things that they uh, now have to do because the children are at home, I, I, I get that it's really, really difficult. And I throw the caveat out there, as Anne-Marie knows that I like to do, that I am not a parent, but I am sympathetic to uh, the cause and to what parents are going through. But does it make sense to reopen schools uh, this school year in places like New York City that have been hard hit? 
Well, I don't think they're going to open it in New York City. First of all, you've already told people that we're not opening the schools. So um, people have left New York City. I mean, literally, we have patients that are all over the country. I mean, they haven't really been able to travel internationally. But now you're going to say, OK, we're going to reopen them for June. You have to come back from California or Oregon or wherever you went to be with your family. Um, I think what they're going to have to do is, if they do reopen schools, they're going to have to give parents the option. You can continue online education, or you can come back to school. And I think what's going to happen in New York, for sure, New York City, I can say, the volume will be way down, because people are going to be petrified to send their kids back to school right now. Um, and also, the public transportation has fallen apart here. Um, we have a huge homelessness problem on the subways, if you've been, I'm sure you've been reporting about it. Um, it's not really that safe right now because of the volume is so low that um, there's a lot of homeless on the subways. Um, there's much less public transportation, so how are you going to get these kids back and forth to school? And you have to think about the teachers who have to come back. And I think the teachers who are elderly or who have illness have to be given the option that they can stay home and not have to come back because they're, they're frontliners and they're putting themselves at risk to teach your kids, but they might have diabetes or cancer or rheumatoid arthritis. So I, I think for this school season for New York, for sure, it's way too soon to say that that they're gonna have that they're gonna come back. And I think it's gonna be optional. I do know that some of my patients' daycare centers have reopened and it's optional. And they say that they're cleaning the rooms every two hours and it's really to get parents who need to go back into the workforce back to work. I mean we have Remember, there are parents who are single parents, and you have, if you have a four-year-old home and you're a single parent and you have to work from home, that's, that's impossible. <laughs> I mean, because you're a babysitter, a full-time entertainment committee, and you have to work. So for some parents, they really need that child care in place, and they need to pay their bills. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hess, all really great points. Thank you so much. Thank you. In New Jersey, a priest went above and beyond the call of duty to issue last rites to a dying parishioner. Reverend Michael Way traveled about an hour to perform the sacrament through a window of the man's nursing home. He wore a mask while he recited the prayers along with the patient. The priest says that he couldn't do it over the phone because of a bad connection, and it worked out for the best because it meant much more to the victim. Coming up, millions of Americans struggle to make their credit card payments. Jill Schlesinger explains the ripple effect this could have on lenders. Stick with us, you're streaming CBSN. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. Now, we need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Rose Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. I mean, you got to help each other out, no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. The U.S. Census Bureau says it will restart field operations in phases, officials told lawmakers that each phase will be based on lockdown orders specific to every region and the ability for census workers to actually access protective gear. The deadline for finishing the once a decade headcount has already been pushed back from the end of April to the end of October, and officials say that they have not ruled out the possibility of further delays. 
Now to Texas, where some businesses are getting ready to reopen Friday, but the state's governor says it will be a few more weeks before barbershops and hair salons can start seeing clients. Ron Trevino from our Houston affiliate station, KHOU, has more. The owners of the Upper Hand Salons have been keeping Houstonians' hairlines tidy for 23 years. All that came to a stop on March 19th. The owners are itching to get back in business. Apparently, so are their customers. Mad rush, yes. No, I do. I expect there to be a rush. I Rachel Gower is co-owner of Upper Hand Salons, along with her husband. She says the hair salon industry has spent the past six weeks planning how shops can reopen and what that would look like. You might see that, that stations are moved a little bit farther apart, six feet apart, perhaps. You'll definitely see all employees wearing masks, and you might even see some employees wearing face shields. The problem, she says, is that face shields and other things like cleaning products are on back order because everyone wants them. But she says the whole process will change from making your appointment to checkout. The industry is overseen by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. We'll be providing guidelines to those licensees about next steps that they should take and things that they can do in addition to the already stringent uh, sanitation requirements that they operate under. But to reopen, it looks like they'll have to wait till the middle of next month. Obviously, we'll support that. Um, but we really feel strongly that there are so many ways that it could be safe to be in a salon right now. The governor says he realizes these shops are eager to reopen, that their customers may be even more eager for that to happen. But if you're like me, in need of a professional haircut, you're going to have to wait a few more weeks. So as this pandemic worsens, millions and millions of Americans are skipping their credit card, pay credit card payments. And that is actually forcing many bi bi banks and lenders to, uh, you know, prepare for perhaps worse economic fallout. So to talk more about this and more about what you can do is Jill Schlesinger. She is our uh, CBS News business analyst. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Jill. It took like a really quick Google for me to find a ton of stories of people who are trying to figure out ways, you know, not to pay their monthly payment on their credit cards because they had, you know, people had problems with credit cards before. They were struggling under the weight of their credit card debt before. I can only imagine that this pandemic has made it worse. Yeah, it's really crazy, actually, because the credit card bills that were accumulating started to pile up. And before the pandemic, we were actually at a seven-year high of credit card delinquencies. So obviously, with 26 million Americans claiming for new unemployment benefits, we know that this is going to be even worse when the next round of data start to pour in. Now, here's the issue. The credit card companies have been in instructed by the government to give what's called forbearance, which means breathing room, no fees and penalties, give some people a little bit of leeway in paying things off, certainly no extra stuff piled on. And that is actually causing some problems for the credit card companies themselves. Not that ever anyone really feels bad for them, but you know, listen, they employ a lot of people also. Stock prices of some of the big issuers are taking a much bigger hit than other financial service firms because they know that many of these credit card accounts will not be able to get paid in full for a very long time. So I guess, Jill, how are the banks and lenders being affected just sort of long term? Well, I think that if you are a big bank and your main business is credit card, then you're going to take a hit. When you look at a big banking center like a J.P. Morgan Chase, they're not just issuing credit cards. They're doing a lot of other activities. And, you know, when you think about it, the, the firms that are out there and they are, you know, they've benefited for essentially 11 years of an economic recovery. So this is part of act, their game plan that they know they've got to plan to write off loans when the economy turns. The question really is how long this lasts and that we don't know yet because the sooner that more of these people get off these unemployment benefits, get back to work, the better they'll be. But I don't see that happening as quickly as many others do. But it seems like some of the lenders and some of the some of the banks that, that uh, run these credit cards are giving people a bit of a break here and there. 
Right. I mean, forbearance is wonderful, right? You say, okay, um, don't pay this bill for three months, right? You maybe say a 90-day reprieve. But there are also reports that many of these companies are being quite squirrely when consumers actually call them up or get in touch with them. They say, okay, they're waiving their late, late fees, they're waiving their interest charges, but then they are creating a balloon payment that's due at the other end of this. And you know what they're also doing mm. is, and I think that wisely, of course, if you're running a business, is they're shutting down lending facilities, meaning you might th have thought your credit limit was $12,000. And the issuer might say, well, you know what, it's actually $5,000. And they can do that. It's perfectly legal. But before you start running up your credit card bill, be sure to understand what is your limit and what are the rules surrounding this forbearance period. Uh, Jill, a lot of Americans are saving their stimulus checks because of life essentials instead of paying down debt. Uh, practically speaking, is there a priority between paying off debt and saving for essentials? What's the good balance that people should be thinking about for those who are skirting on the edge? I think if you're on the edge, if you're unemployed, if you've been negatively impacted financially from this pandemic, it's all about conserving your cash. So I would not be in a rush to pay down any debt at all. And I've been fielding questions from my podcast every single day, and I have found that people really want to try to get rid of that debt. And I'm saying, look, in normal times, I love you to pay down high interest debt. These are not normal times. We're at the extreme. You've got to conserve your cash for a rainy day. It's not a rainy day, my friends. It is pouring. It is a storm. It's a one in a hundred year flood. It's a hurricane and it's a wildfire and it happened all at once. So the time to actually pay down your debt will be when we understand what your financial condition is probably in the next 60 to 90 days. For now, do not be in a rush to pay down any debt. Conserve your cash. Do prioritize your bills. There's a great tool on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's website, consumerfinance.gov, or if you just Google Bill priority, priority Tool, CFPB, you'll see. And the only thing that I think is your priority right now is feeding you and your family. Everything else is negotiable. So then this isn't a time to sort of worry about pulling yourself out of credit card debt. Or, you know, maybe you have a regular paycheck and maybe this is a good time to do that. Okay, so let's, let's, let's draw a distinction. You have a job. It seems secure. You've got the cash flow. Now, if you can, and you can start accelerating that debt payment, fantastic. Same with your student loans. You know, there is no interest being charged on federal student loans until September 30th. If you've got extra cash flow and you can pay down a 6% student loan, this is a great time to do that. If you have extra cash flow and you've got a 16% credit card bill, sure, it's a great time to do that. But if you don't have six to 12 months of your living expenses sitting in a safe place, please make that the number one priority. Hmm. Jill Schlesinger, always bringing the knowledge uh, when we so sorely need it. Jill, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. All right. UPS is teaming up with CVS Health Corporation. That's CVS Health Corporation to significantly expand its drone delivery program. Starting in May, UPS subsidiary flight, Ford, will use drones to deliver prescription medicines to more than 135,000 seniors at a Florida retirement community. The company previously began conducting drone delivery experiments in North Carolina in the hopes of helping those who cannot leave their homes. So coming up, the primary contest in Ohio today, voting in the era of the coronavirus and how the Buckeye State may be setting the bar for future U.S. elections. We'll be right back. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. 
and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences? All right, in this pandemic, you might have thought that perhaps nothing's going on in the world of sports, but nothing could be further from the truth. And to prove that to you, Anne-Marie, let's bring in James Brown to talk to us about what is going on in the world of athletics. There's a lot going on, JB. And you know what? You know about it all because I see you everywhere. So the adjective that describes you will be what? Uh, Peripatetic? Yes, indeed. That is, uh, first, the case. Hey, first of all, I know ubiquitous. that a lot of people are <laughs> ubiquitous. That would be better. Peripatetic is traveling a lot. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, there is a lot going on, but most of it, Vlad, is centered around trying to see when life will return to normal in the professional world of sports, as well as, uh, of course, those of us in regular life. But the NBA has decided to dip its toes into the water by allowing players in those states where restrictions are slowly being lifted to go to team-run facilities, gyms, to get some practice time in. No more than four players at a time, keeping that in mind. And number two, there can be no team personnel there to conduct, if you will, an organized uh, practice just allowing the guys to knock off the uh, the cobwebs, the rust, if you will, so that if there is a truncated season, um, guys won't be missing slam dunks, if you will. <laughs> and uh, the NFL getting busy as well, right? Uh, the NFL uh, had their draft over the weekend. Normally it's a big splashy event. This time they had to do it virtually. And it was actually really interesting to watch for me. I thought it was great, but it was a bit of a technological feat. You know what, and let me give uh, kudos first to that aspect of it, Anne-Marie. You, Vlad, and I know that the technical geniuses with whom we work don't get enough credit. This was a Herculean task that I think was pulled off magnificently. When you consider 32 teams, you've got uh, coaches and general managers. You've got the players, some of their home shots. You've got the uh, commissioner who was uh, comfortably ensconced in the basement of his home. And many people, uh, in, a, in addition to watching to see which players were going to be drafted by their favorite teams, I think a lot of the interest early on for the 15 million plus who watch was to see what the digs were like where they were shooting. Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboys, <laughs> was on his, uh, excuse me, Vlad and Amory, $250 million yacht. Of course, uh, Bill Belichick, the coach of the um, uh, New England Patriots, his dog made an appearance in the kitchen. So a lot of people, and a lot of people were really amazed at the palatial digs of Cliff Kingsbury, the um, head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. So most people were looking like that, which is why I have my library doors closed a little bit so you won't see the books on the floor. 
<laughs> yeah, they probably could have done something. Uh, they probably could have co-branded it, uh, you know, with Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous slash the NFL Draft with all those GMs um, and owners uh, in their very fancy digs uh, that the rest of us can only dream about. Uh, but it was still, as you point out, JB, it was still really interesting to do something uh, like that virtually. And it does point to something that I think a lot of people are talking, not just in the world of sports, but just in the way that we operate as a country and perhaps even globally, uh, that a lot of the things that we used to do are going to look very different. Now that technology is allowing people to do things even uh, as significant and as splashy, as Anne-Marie pointed out, as the NFL draft. So that's mm. sort of like painting and or pointing certainly. us to the world uh, to come. Well, it is often referred to as the new normal. I think uh, executives and the like will incorporate some of these things that we've engaged now in this new normal environment. But let me just say real quickly that as far as the world of sports is concerned, that, what really, that which really touches my heart are the personal stories, the behind-the-scenes stories about these players. I think about the young man Etor Gross Matos, who played at Penn State, drafted in the second round by the Carolina Panthers. He overcame two tragic events. His father, biological father, drowned trying to save him when he was two years old and fallen off a boat. Austin Jackson, the offensive lineman from USC, who's going to be going to the Miami Dolphins, he gave bone marrow transplant, if you will, marrow to his sister who was threatened for sure uh, because she had a rare disease where she couldn't produce enough blood. So now she's able to live as a result of um, him doing that. And Jonathan Taylor, a running back out of Wisconsin, who really is a renaissance man. The kid, um, he loves Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson. That was his hero. And he turned down an opportunity to go and study astrophysics at um, Harvard and uh, went to Wisconsin. So there's some really exciting characters with good backstories coming into the league as well. That's really the stuff that people love to tune in for. Yeah, they want to know who goes where, but those backstories, that's the stuff that you're sort of riveted to, and you don't need all the extra pizzazz to sell a really good story. It just it stands on its own. But speaking of a really good story that we kind of like dropped because, you know, everything changed. Um, last time when we were able to sort of gather and talk, we were talking a lot about the Red Sox cheating scandal in 2018. MLB wrapped up their investigation. What did they conclude? So they concluded that there was some cheating involved, a videographer for the team who uh, was able to capture a lot of the signals of the opposition and especially taking note when some of the signals they thought they had studied uh, previously had changed and that information was passed to the players. Now, the report said that it was done occasionally. And I know you hear the sarcasm in my voice with respect to that. And because it was less egregious than the Houston Astros, the uh, Red Sox will lose two draft picks, if you will. The videographer himself is suspended for the 2020 and 2021 season. But Amory and Vlad, let me just add a little personal strong feeling here. Cheating is cheating. There's no such thing as being a little pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. And to the degree that professional athletes and any of us as adults are supposed to be modeling behavior that young people will want to parrot, then you know what? This ought to be a serious issue no matter what, and the punishment ought to equal that. We talk about good sportsmanship. Well, you know what? The adults need to model that. Hmm. It's a great point, JB. Uh, and I, I think we both agree with you on that. And that's why I'm happy to end with a good note on baseball, something that is uplifting versus what we just talked about with regards to the Red Sox. Uh, and it's about baseball being played overseas. Um, here's just a preview of what that looks like in Taiwan. Let's show our viewers. <laughs> All right, I'm looking at it from afar here, JB. I can't tell what it is, but whatever it is, it looks good. <laughs> hey, Vlad, I love your honesty. Well, you know, Taiwanese, uh, one of the keys to them being able to start their season is that uh, they, their response to the coronavirus pandemic was early. 
uh, and quick and swift. So uh, the, the stats say that some 450 cases out of the population of 23 million. So they're opening the stadiums, no fans. There are some cardboard placards and cutouts simulating fans in the stands, but they're getting underway as a, as a result. And I'm sure that the uh, leaders of professional sports here are taking some notes as well. It, it, it looks like cheerleaders. That's a little different. <laughs> Well, you know what, hey, Vlad and uh, Anne Marie, I haven't seen what the placards look like, so it'll be interesting to see how creative they get. But even from a safety standpoint, the players are having their temperature taken as they come into the parking lot, and then they go through a, um, a, a body scanner as well to infrared just to exercise the greatest of precautions as well. And Anne Marie, when they can get a real cheerleader in the stand, Vlad and I will be there to flank you to make sure all goes well. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> JV, thank you so much. Fun it's fact, I spent, I, I spent a couple of months mm -hmm. as a collegiate cheerleader um, before I got uh, bounced off the team. Wow. <laughs> No, no, Vlad, that's why you are still in great shape and you can buy your suits off the rack. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I miss hanging out with you in person, JV. <laughs> yeah. Hey, likewise. Look forward to thank seeing the so both much, of you Amy. soon. Stay safe. Stay safe and stay well. All right, so still ahead, we're going to be bringing you the latest on the coronavirus with live updates from across the nation and around the world as officials struggle to deal with this pandemic. And if you haven't already, you know what I'm going to say. Don't forget to download the free CBS News app on all your devices. You can watch CBSN anytime, anywhere, on any connected device. Open Anywhere is at home, where we all should be. The app is free, and so is our website, cbsnews.com. We'll be right back. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. Now, we need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. You gotta help each other out, no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Making sense of our world. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. As states begin to reopen their economies, the White House is laying out a strategy for ramping up testing across the country. Ben Tracy is following the latest at the White House, and he joins us now. Uh, so, Ben, what types of testing uh, are they focusing on, and how does the plan divide responsibilities between the federal government and state and uh, local governments, as well as private companies? 
So the tests are intended to be the swab tests, and apparently they've improved these tests where they don't have to stick this swab so far up your nose. They say it's not as uncomfortable as it used to be. And some of these tests will actually be done in these drive through testing centers that are slowly being set up in the parking lots of retailers across the country. But overall, this plan that the president touted yesterday in the Rose Garden with much fanfare is really mostly repackaging of things the administration has already done, and it shifts most of the burden for testing to the states themselves. It calls the federal government the supplier of last resort and says that the states basically have to set up and manage these programs on their own. The one thing that we have been told uh, here at the White House is that they're going to provide every state in the country enough tests to test 2% of their population. Weirdly enough, that's something the president did not even mention yesterday at the event. Uh, it also is, is far less than what these states actually need to do widespread testing. Yeah, perhaps that's why the president didn't mention 2%, because that's not what most experts say is required to have, you know, a generally safe reopening of the country. Um, but let's talk about the numbers. You know, I think the president kind of bragged about, I think, the number of tests have doubled um, per month or per day per day. I can't remember exactly what he was saying. Um, and, you know, he was sort of talking about how impressive that is, that the numbers are going up. But how does that compare to what's happening in other countries? So when the president talks about this, he's generally right, but he's not telling the whole story. So we have tested about, uh, conducted about five and a half million tests in the country. Uh, that's about 1.6 percent of the American population. The president likes to say we've done more tests than anyone in the world. That's factually true in terms of the number of tests. But when you look at it on a per capita basis, so tests per million people in your country, we actually rank we actually rank number nine. Uh, the number one country in the world, uh, incidentally, is uh, Portugal. So that's kind of interesting. So we need to do a lot more testing. I mean, the experts are saying that we need to be testing five million people per day by June and 20 million people per day in July. And we have so far only done five and a half million in total over the course of the last uh, month and a half, two months. Hmm. Uh, ben, uh, the president of the United States, uh, of course, has been tweeting this morning. And uh, as we approach uh, a, an astounding number of people who have died in this country uh, from COVID-19, uh, over 50,000, we're very close to the number of people, of, of, of Americans that were killed uh, during the war in Vietnam, which is 58,000. Uh, the president is tweeting about the press again and about the fact that he's not being asked uh, as much about ventilators. Can you explain to our audience, uh, and of course he's saying that the press is complaining, which of course, you know, I'm not even going to uh, sort of touch upon that, but, but the, the, the fact that the point that the president is making is that he's not getting asked as many questions about ventilators. He, keeps fix, fi he is fixated on the ventilator question. Um, can you just explain to our audience, you know, you know why? The press may have been asking about ventilators uh, a couple of weeks ago because governors were asking about them um, in the wake of the increasing numbers of people who needed to be on ventilators. And where are we today? Yeah, it's exactly what you just said. I mean, the ventilator issue was a huge issue a couple of weeks ago because you had governors on TV every day, especially the governor of New York, saying we don't have enough of these and people are going to die. And there was real pressure on the federal government to release the ventilators it had in the federal stockpile for the president to use his authority under the uh, Defense Production Act to get more ventilators made. And all of that did happen. And the ventilator part of it is a somewhat of a success story here. The president likes to call himself now the king of ventilators and that we're going to give these ventilators to uh, some of our allies around the world who are in need of them. But the reason we don't ask about ventilators anymore is because it's not such a big issue. It's not what states need right now to save people's lives. The president would prefer that we ask those questions so he could talk about what a success that has been, uh, at least in his mind. So yesterday's briefing was a little bit of a surprise. Initially, we're t we were told that there were not going to be any more briefings, and then we learned that there was going to be one in the Rose Garden. And of course, we heard that there weren't going to be briefings, or not as many, after the president suggested some sort of intravenous um, uh, use of, um, of uh, bleach or peroxide or something along those lines to combat the coronavirus. So we figured, you know, that didn't go over well. Maybe 
maybe he doesn't want to face the media, but he did. And he was asked directly about whether or not he thought that his words had an impact on the spike in phone calls about bleach and other disinfectants. Um, what was his response, Ben? He really pretty quickly dismissed that question. When that was asked, I thought it might be one of those questions that would kind of set the president off. But he basically said, I don't know why people would have done that. Uh, but we have heard from governors, both Democrats and Republicans, said that they had spikes to their health departments from people who were asking, one, should they ingest disinfectant, or from people who actually did it and then needed help. So this likely wasn't a widespread issue around the country, but even if a couple of people had done that, that that's a real problem. Uh, but the president really dismissed that, and he said that he takes no responsibility for that. And his, uh, his reasoning for what he said uh, over the weekend, he dismissed that all as sarcasm, that he was just being sarcastic, and apparently the rest of us uh, were not in on the joke. Hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, responsibility, Ben, uh, let's talk about the new reporting out by the Washington Post uh, that says U.S. intelligence agencies offered warnings about the coronavirus in briefings presented to the President of the United States in January and in February. Uh, what can you tell us about those reports and how the White House is responding? Yeah, so the Washington Post is saying that there were more than 12 warnings that were in the president's PDB, the presidential daily brief, and that these were happening uh, in the very early parts of this, this breakout of this virus in China and then once it became an epidemic, so back in January and February. What's notable about this is that if those were in the president's brief and if he was briefed on that issue or if he read it, um, the president was then saying publicly things that were very much downplaying the threat of this. He was saying that cases are under control, that come April this will uh, disappear like a miracle. So if the president got that information and then was saying something very different publicly, uh, th there's some questions there. But there also are some questions to the extent of whether he got the information or not. There, there's been widespread reporting that the president doesn't always read the brief or take the briefing. So it's not entirely clear how many times he was told that. But there certainly was a disconnect between the intelligence and what the president was saying publicly. Now, the White House has pushed back pretty hard on this, saying that the president never downplayed the threat of this, uh, that he was always kept well informed. Uh, so certainly uh, a, a disconnect there. Mm. Yeah. The White House is also saying that the president is so busy that he has no time to eat, Ben, but uh, he certainly has time to tweet, as evidenced by this weekend. Uh, as always, Ben, uh, from the White House, we appreciate it. Thanks. Face masks are quickly becoming the must-have the must-have accessory during this pandemic. Uh, starting May 4th, JetBlue is requiring all passengers to wear masks from the time they check in to the time they deplane. Meanwhile, American Airlines says that it will start handing out masks and sanitizer directly to flyers next month. The two airlines are among several other U.S. carriers that require flight attendants to wear face masks as well. New explosive details have emerged about a cruise ship continuing to sail worldwide despite knowing about the coronavirus threat. A new report by the Washington Post exposes how the industry appeared to downplay early warnings and proceed with normal operations. Thousands of cases have been reported aboard ships and dozens of passengers have died from the virus. The Post featured one American woman who was aboard a cruise ship during the early days of the pandemic. People are a little nervous about the COVID-19 panic that's going on throughout the world. Um, had messages on cruise critic this morning that someone was taken off the, off the ship yesterday with respiratory illnesses. Um, I don't think that's true. I saw the ambulance leaving. They were not even, there was no masks on the people that were working. So Washington Post reporter uh, Rosalind Helderman worked on that story and she joins us now. Rosalind, it's a great piece. There's also for people who, I don't know if you want to read, if you don't want to read, but there's a video that goes with it that really tracks one particular cruise ship and how it was able to pass the infection on to multiple locations within the Caribbean. And that's just one cruise ship. There are many more cruise ships uh, doing those routes. So let's talk about this. The question that kept on bubbling up to me is, it's obvious that cruise ships are tailor-made for the spread of a virus like this. We've seen the neurovirus and the way can spread on a cruise ship. Why, in the midst of the growing concern about the coronavirus, were these cruise ships permitted to sail? 
Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, people may remember that one of the very sort of early dramas of coronavirus was this enormous cruise ship in Japan, the Diamond Princess, where ultimately more than 700 people tested positive. And that was way back in February. Um, but the industry kept saying they could make this safe. They could clean the ships. Uh, they could do some temperature checks and health screenings of passengers. And, you know, they employ a lot of people. Uh, they also uh, have some key officials who are close to the, to the White House in the United States. Uh, and they insisted that they should be able to keep, to keep cruising. And so they did. Uh, it wasn't until March 13th, uh, two days after uh, uh, coronavirus was declared a global pandemic, that the industry finally stopped new sales. And by that time, there were dozens of ships already out at sea with thousands of people aboard. It's fascinating. And Rosalind, you and your fellow Washington Post reporters spoke with a number of cruise ship passengers and crew members, some of whom tested positive for the virus. Uh, what were their reactions to your investigation? Well, there was a lot of disappointment, uh, of course. I mean, really, I think one of the more sort of shocking or upsetting uh, examples of this is that there are a number of ships uh, where people were struggling to get home after the no sale order was put in place. And they were out on these ships for lengthy periods of time being told by the ships that there was no coronavirus on board. Uh, we had an example of one ship where they did daily activities, including gathering to cheer for healthcare workers, you know, shoulder to shoulder, packed together hundreds of people, uh, and they weren't safe. There was coronavirus on that ship, and several hundred people, it appears, have now tested positive from that ship alone. So the CEO of Carnival has been really sort of out front um, defending the industry. His name is uh, Arnold Donald, and he responded to the Washington Post, uh, Post uh, report. Let's play a little bit of his response. There was very little knowledge you know, starting early on in February and March and whatnot. Um, you know, we aggressively managed it as we do any illness on board. Okay, so it occurred to me, Rosalind, that I think, uh, you know, his responses have kind of been evolving a little bit. He was sort of essentially saying, we did everything possible, we followed all guidelines. And now I'm starting to hear him say, well, no one knew anything about, you know, what the potential was here. What's your take on his response? Yeah, I mean, the industry started off being quite defensive. Uh, there's another interview where that same executive talked about how cruise ships are uh, uh, not places where you would be more likely to catch it than on shore. He compared a cruise ship to Central Park, where you could naturally socially distance. And the scientists, including from the, SD, from the CDC, say that that fits within crew. Uh, what we've got is thousands of people in very tight quarters for lengthy periods of time, uh, many of them on the older side of the population, being brought from place to place. Uh, and they say the reality is uh, that that just is, is an elevated risk that needs to be addressed. And uh, just in recent days, we started to hear some cruise executives, we spoke to one from Royal Caribbean, for instance, talking about how, you know, there do have to be some lessons learned from this experience if you don't think that, you know, you've got to be more humble than to think there are no lessons to be learned here. Uh, and Rosalind, one other interesting point in your article, you mentioned this political backdrop to all of your investigation. What's been the White House's reaction to cruise ships continuing to sail despite the coronavirus threat? And I wonder, uh, are there any links between the Trump administration uh, and the cruise ship industry uh, from the president on down? Yeah, I mean, the president comes from the hospitality industry. Uh, he is familiar with this world. He's familiar with some of these executives, in particular Carnival, which is the world's largest uh, cruise ship owner, uh, actually was a sponsor for some time of The Apprentice. And there were episodes that featured mentions of, of Carnival. And so President Trump, at the start of this, in the period of time where he was sort of downplaying coronavirus, would speak uh, very, very much of his desire to make sure the industry kept sailing. Uh, and that it was not harmed by this. Uh, other executives within the government, other officials, uh, grew upset with this and thought that what the industry was doing voluntarily was not sufficient. Uh, and so ultimately, the CDC did step in and order the cruise lines to stop sailing. They've extended that no sail order. Uh, so they are now not allowed to sail in U.S. waters until sometime in the summer. But the real test is going to be what happens then. 
All right, uh, Rosalind Helderman, really great article. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So coming up, we want to tell you about a complication of the coronavirus that is linked to children. We're going to be speaking to a pediatrician about a very rare illness in children that may be brought on by the coronavirus. So stick around for that. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences? All right, we're going to take you to New York now, where Governor Cuomo is holding his daily briefings on the coronavirus. Let's listen. Total hospitalization rate is down a tick, which is good news. The uh, change in hospitalization on a rolling total you see is down. Number of intubations is also down. The number of COVID hospitalizations per day, these are new people who are newly diagnosed with COVID. Uh, it's under 1,000, which is good news. It's still a significant number of people, 900 people. After all of this, we still have 900 new infections yesterday uh, on a three-day rolling average. But overall, you see the numbers coming down. So that's good news. This is the worst news uh, every day. I think maybe today is the day the nightmare will be over, but it's not. 335. Uh, people passed away yesterday from this virus in this state. That's 335 families. You see this number is basically reducing, but not at a tremendous rate. And the only thing tremendous is the number of New Yorkers who still pass away. Uh, everyone is talking about reopening. I get it. You can't sustain being closed. The economy can't sustain it. Individual families can't sustain it. We can't sustain it on a personal level. Our children can't sustain it. But we have to, when we talk about reopening, this should not be a political discussion. It shouldn't be a philosophical discussion. It shouldn't be because people are protesting or uh, some people want it, some people don't want it. Uh, it is a factual discussion on reopening, right? So let's uh, demystify it a little bit, because in this environment, it's becoming uh, rhetorical rather than factual. We want to reopen, but we want to do it without infecting more people or overwhelming the hospital system. We're at Upstate Medical today. Our great fear was the number of people infected would overwhelm the hospital capacity. So that's the balance, 
reopen, but don't increase the number of infected people and don't overwhelm the hospital system. Well, then design that system in reopening, right? Uh, you, can, you can factually, with data, design a system that does just that. And that's what government is supposed to do. Government is not about spouting political or philosophical opinions. Government is about running services, uh, designing programs that actually work for the people to address the problem. And in this situation, we can actually measure. We have data. We have facts. So measure what is happening in society and calibrate your reopening to those measurements, right? So uh, we're adopting a set of rules, a set of guidelines. We've studied reopening plans all around the country. We've spoken to every expert on the globe who's been through this before. And we've come up with factual data points to guide us on reopening. Uh, first point, don't overwhelm the hospital system. If the hospital system in an area exceeds 70% capacity, which means you're 30%, uh, you only have 30% left, or the rate of transmission of the virus hits 1.1, those are danger signs. We know that. Remember, hospital capacity, if you're at 70% on your hospitals, there's a two-week lag on this virus. So if you ever hit 70%, you can expect the number go to go up for the next two weeks as people become who just got infected actually get ill and some of them come into the hospitals. So 70% is a safe metric to use for your hospital capacity. If the transmission rate hits 1.1, that's what they call outbreak. That means it's going to spread much, much faster. You wouldn't start. All right, we're going to peel away from Governor Cuomo just for a little bit because uh, we're going to take you to the White House where President Trump has been see speaking with Florida you know, Governor Ron DeSantis. Florida, so uh, Florida is uh, looking towards reopening. Some of the beaches have already reopened. We're going to play a little bit of the Q&A that they had with reporters, then return to Cuomo exactly where we left off so you're not going to miss a thing. So we're doing I-4 in Orlando. We're doing bridges in Tampa. So we had a lot of things going. So, so that's through April 30th. Uh, I've worked with the White House on kind of going to phase one. I'm going to make an announcement tomorrow, but I think that for Florida, going from where we are now to phase one is not a very uh, a big leap. I think that you know, we'll be able to be a small step for us, but we're going to approach it in a very measured, thoughtful, and data-driven way, and I think that that's, that's what most of the folks uh, throughout the state are looking for. So you won't be doing what they did in Georgia. Ron saw the empty roads. And he was telling me before, it was fascinating, he saw the empty roads all over Florida from doing this, where they're staying at home. And he said, this is a great time to build roads. This is a great time to fix bridges. They were fixing bridges down there where normally there'd be a traffic nightmare, and they're fixing bridges, and there's hardly any traffic. Yeah, so they, we've been able to accelerate key projects uh, by as much as two months. And so when, as people get back into the swing of things, and this is going to be a gradual process, you're going to end up having reduced congestion probably more than we've ever done in such a short period of time. So I think it was taking advantage of an opportunity. Uh, so, 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 so do, do, do more tests than demand, is that the norm in this country, do you think? Uh, it's uh, true in other places. It's uh, definitely true with Iran. It uh, seems to be true where the governors have done the proper job using us and utilizing the services that we provide. But uh, it is also true in certain other locations. I, was, I would say, just so, just so people don't get the misimpression, you know, we have seven sites in major areas in our state. We have more capacity than we get. These walk-up sites, though, have gone into areas that were underserved. You do have demand there. And so I think what, so we, we definitely have enough supplies and everything, but I think the key is going to be finding pockets that maybe we're not testing as much. I mean, obviously, we've got testing everywhere in Miami because they have the most cases. We have testing in, in other parts. Um, so I think this walk-up site is going to give us some confidence yeah. that we're going into places that may have been overlooked and giving people easy access. I also just recently uh, got re or suspended any regulations that would prevent licensed pharmacists from administering tests. 
So CVS and Walmart, you're hopefully, and I think they're interested in doing this, or Walgreens, you could actually maybe go in there and the licensed pharmacists will be able to test you. That's going to be very convenient for an awful lot of people. Mr. President, overall, South Korea has done five times more tests than the U.S. per capita. Why is that? I don't think that's true. That, that is true. And you I said this morning that the White House said the U.S. passes South Korea in virus true. testing. Who are you with? Uh, Yahoo News. And it's not true per capita. Uh, do you want to respond to that, do you, if you have the numbers? Sure, I have the numbers. So remember early on, we pushed test to the outbreak areas, just like he described. His primary outbreak was in Miami-Dade and Broward County and Palm Beach, so they pushed test into that region. We did the same thing in the United States. So if you look at every single state that had an outbreak, their testing is greater than anywhere in the world. They're in the four per, you know, 42 per thousand range. Your, your point is taken about um, individual areas, but overall we've had 14 times more infections than South Korea. So are we doing something wrong and why is that? They have a very dense population. Yeah, our epidemic looks much more like the European epidemic. So right now we're tracking very close to the countries in Europe and we're testing at their rate of, of their concentrated epidemics and where they're occurring in the metros. I think it really shows the susceptibility of our major cities in the same way they were susceptible in Europe. And so we've been very focused on that. That's not to say that, that we're not Korea supporting the rural states. Cities, we're very much supporting the rural states and very much supporting their testing. There's no, there's no state right now in the United States that's tested really less than 1%, which is pretty remarkable when they don't really have significant cases. But we've been really working with states to do sentinel surveillance and also to reach out to our Native American populations as well as our inner city. So I think now that we've expanded testing dramatically and CDC has altered the criteria for testing, I think you'll see as, as governors have unlocked more and more potential in their laboratories, we know that we have more laboratory capacity. And you hear the governors talk about we have capacity and now we have to match um, things, you know, the resources that you need, the swabs and the extraction media with the capacity. And I think governors are well aware of how to expand testing now. And so we're in that partnership. That's what was announced yesterday. We want testing linked to critical contact tracing, but we also want testing as he described. The governor described a really important insight. He went where the virus could cause the most damage to human beings. And so he went into the nursing homes to really proactively test. And, and that's, that's true really also in throughout our, the country. Yes, and that's true in our, that's why it's in the blueprint. And I think some of the press didn't hear how much we were emphasizing the asymptomatic testing. We believe that's a critical part of this. So you can't approach this like you've just traditionally approached flu. And you have to be more innovative. And we've been in really a strong partnership with the governors. And I think that's why the blueprint was so important because it talked about symptomatic testing and asymptomatic testing to protect the most vulnerable individuals. And you can see what it did with the nursing home fatality rates. Well, I mean, especially with the asymptomatic, uh, in a nursing home situation, if that starts getting out, man, that is a perfect environment for this virus to just start spread. I mean, it can spread like wildfire very covered, quickly. Covered. So no, that's, you why you're your state till April that's why you're trying to do why, why don't all this you wait stuff. Why you worried people dying because of that? So we're going to make an announcement tomorrow. You know, I, I created a task force, and uh, I have all kinds of folks. We have all some of the great health systems. We have great docs. We've got business folks. I've got elected officials. They've submitted a report to me. I'm going to be reviewing that today. Obviously, we've been thinking about what we're going to need to do, and so, so we'll announce it uh, tomorrow uh, about the next step forward for Florida. But I'll just wait to announce it then. Governor, you still have flights coming from Latin America to Miami. And we see uh, an increase of cases in Latin America and South America. Aren't you worried to see those? Oh, I've been worried about that the whole time. I mean, I think that Brazil and some of those places, which I have a lot of interaction with Miami, you're going to probably see the epidemic increase there as their season changes. And so we so could what, potentially what have, we could be uh, way on the other side doing well in Florida, and then you could just have people kind of come in. So uh, one of the things I've mentioned to the president is, you know, you have this Abbott Labs test. If you have some of these international flights, maybe some of these airliners should, should, it should be on them to check before they're getting on and coming to this country so that we're able to keep it. I mean, you've seen what happened with the China flight restrictions. 
that kept a lot of people from seeding the West Coast more. And so if we're in a situation you could potentially have from hotspots coming in, I think we were technologically more advanced where there should be something uh, like that. So I, I've been advocating for that. I've talked with uh, some other governors about it. But for Florida, clearly, that's going to be an issue. You look well, at- be cutting off Brazil. I mean, you're going to- Well, not necessarily cut them off, but it's just if, if you're going to fly to Miami, then the airline should give you the Abbott test and then put you on the plane. But Would you ever want to ban certain countries? If they're if if they were seeding the United States, I think you'll you should let ban us them. Know. You'll for be sure. watching and you'll let us know. But I would say in the United States or in Florida, excuse me, in spite of all the international travel, I mean we have so many people that go to Orlando, Miami, and all that. Um, if you look at our outbreak, not a lot of it is tied to that. It's mostly tied to New York City travel the end of the three Southern Florida because the Orlando situation is worlds different than Palm Beach and Broward and Miami-Dade, but yet they have as much international travel as anybody. And yet, as of this morning, I think Orlando had uh, 50 people hospitalized in that whole area for COVID-19. I mean, people were predicting there were gonna be hundreds of thousands hospitalized in Florida by this time. So, so they've had a, a really modest outbreak. Southeast Florida, I mean, still by some of these other standards, not, not as bad as other parts of the country, but that was really a more of a domestic seeding, I think, than international. Well, we're going to be in touch on that. Go ahead. So why not then uh, require that people take tests before they take international flights? And why not even require that people wear masks so on planes? So we're looking at that, and we're probably going to be doing that. Brazil has pretty much of an outbreak, as you know. Uh, uh, they also went a different way than other countries in South America. If you look at the chart, you'll see what happened, unfortunately, to Brazil. So we're looking at it very closely, and we're in coordination with other governors also, but in particular with Ron. We'll make that decision pretty soon. So we're all looking flights, at all international flights. Well, we're looking at that. That's a very big thing to do. You know, again, so I did it with correct. China, I did it with Europe. Uh, that's a very big thing to do. It's certainly a very big thing to do to Florida because you have so much business from South America. I mean, I mean, so I we'll, be, we'll be looking at that. So to our Yahoo gentlemen, I just want to make it clear that um, South Korea's testing was 11 per Per a hundred thousand, and we're at seventeen per hundred thousand. Right. So are you going to apologize, Yahoo? That's why you're Yahoo, and nobody knows who that you are. Go ahead. Let's Based go, on Jeff. the numbers I've, I've seen, that's, that's, that's why not. nobody knows who you are, including me. Go ahead. Just, just, just check to, it again. Okay. You want to get your facts right before you. Well, we have had we have had fourteen. Okay, when your facts are wrong. Let's go. Just to clarify what you were just talking about, you're looking at cutting off more international travel from Latin America. No, we're looking. We're talking to the governor. We're talking with others also that have a lot of business coming in from South America, Latin America, and we'll make a determination. Uh, we're also uh, setting up uh, a system where we do some testing, and we're working with the airlines on that. Temperature and testing and on the plane, getting on the plane. Temperature and, and virus testing. Uh, it'll be both. Thank you. And Governor DeSantis, you did face quite a bit of criticism for not closing your state as soon as some did. Uh, there was a yeah, lot of attention. What have the results been? You look at some of the most draconian orders that have been issued in some of these states and compare Florida in terms of our hospitalizations per 100,000, in terms of our fatalities per 100,000. I mean, you go from D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, you name it, Florida's done better, and I'm not criticizing those states, but everyone in the media was saying Florida was gonna be like New York or Italy, and that has not happened because we understood we have a big diverse state, we understood the outbreak was not uniform throughout the state, and we had a tailored and measured approach that not only helped our numbers be way below what anyone predicted, but also did less damage to our state going forward. I had construction going on, the road projects, but we did it in a safe way, and we did it, I think, in a way that is probably more sustainable um, over the long term. So I think people can go back and look at all the criticism and then look now, and nobody predicted that Florida would. We have challenges. This is not an easy situation. We've had people in the hospital, but I am now in a situation where I have less than 500 people at a state of 22 million on ventilators as of last night, and I have 6,000 in 500 ventilators that are sitting idle, unused throughout the state of Florida. So, so, my, so, so my question is, I mean, you face that criticism, you have these numbers that you're sharing. Are you concerned at all about another outbreak coming uh, this summer or this fall and not being ready for so it? So of course, that's why the whole thing we're doing is, this is a novel virus, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. Um, but we're in a situation now where we have so many more tools to be able to detect 
And, and one of the things that um, I was talking to Dr. Burks about, our Florida Department of Health, we have a fully integrated uh, health system with the counties. We have been doing contact tracing from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, sure, once the outbreak gets to a certain point, the mitigation is really what you do. The contact tracing is not going to be able to stop like what was going on in New York City. But in Florida, we had such an uneven outbreak, we were doing contact tracing throughout this whole time in parts of the state that the outbreak wasn't as severe. They limited the spread uh, and did it very effectively. And so that's going to be a huge part of what we're doing going forward. And we think that uh, we think that, that can be successful. And we're going to have so many more opportunities with sentinel surveillance. We're offensive with the nursing homes. Nothing's going to change on, on the nursing home testing. This is until this virus goes away, this is the population that is most at risk. In Florida, we have close to 85% of the fatalities have been age 65 or older, and most of them have some comorbidities. And so these are the types of facilities that are the most at risk. So nothing's gonna change on that. We're gonna continue uh, protecting elderly, and we messaged that very early about the risk, about how they should stay home. I wasn't gonna arrest an elderly if they you know, left their house, but we told them limit contacts because you're more at risk and they listen. That's why you go to a place like the villages. There were articles written saying, oh, the villages is gonna crash and burn, all this other stuff. They have like a 2%, 2.5% infection rate. We tested 1,200 asymptomatic and none were, none were found to have the virus. And so this is this message of understanding the risks are different for different parts of our communities and age and health and, and continue doing all. So I think what you'll see is uh, however we move forward, and I'll announce that soon, you're going to see even more attention paid to the vulnerable. Uh, and I think that that's what we need to be doing. And you know, Ron, uh, Ron said one thing that was very interesting. You talk about ventilators, and ventilators were going to be a disaster in Florida, a disaster, not enough. And we sent them thousands of ventilators. But in the meantime, you have thousands of ventilators that aren't used, and we'll be able to send them probably to other countries. You'll build up your stockpile. But we'll be able, because other countries, uh, Italy, France, uh, numerous, Spain is very much, we're sending to Spain. Uh, I spoke today to uh, uh, Nigeria. They want, they'll do anything for ventilators. We're going to send at least 200 ventilators to Nigeria, probably more than that. So, uh, but ventilators was going to be a big problem. And now we have really, a, I mean, through a, an incredible amount of work by the federal government, we have a big, big, beautiful overcapacity. And it's the same thing with testing. The only problem is the press doesn't give credit for that because, you know, no matter what test you do, they'll say, oh, you should have done this. You should have tested 325 million people 37 times. Uh, no, the testing is going very well. But this is a good example of a partnership between the federal government and a state government. Ron has been great. And some of your friends, some of the other governors have done a good job, and some haven't done a very good job, I'll be honest with you. Some have not. But one of the things I think, um, you know, Jared, he had a team of going about, like, figuring out where the ventilators would be needed. So when, when everyone was talking about 40,000 ventilators in New York, I'm in contact with Jared about Florida, about New York, and he was saying, well, they're not going to need that. And I was like, look, I, I actually, I agree with your numbers. I don't think we need any ventilators in Florida right now. Maybe things will change. So they were ready at a moment's notice to get the ventilators wherever they need. We never got, I think we may have just gotten 100 at the beginning from FEMA, but we never got like an emergency shipment because we didn't need it. But they were absolutely ready, willing, and able to do that once the data suggested they, they were on call. To. A lot of people expected it. When we uh, read reports from the papers, I'd call Ron and say, Ron, I think we're going to need maybe thousands based on what some phony news uh, organization was saying. And more and more, you know, number one, it was well handled, but we were ready to move, and we still are. We have more than 10,000. Jared, what do we have? 10,000? Uh, more than 10,000 in more stockpile. Than, more than 10,000, and it's growing every day. We're yeah. getting a lot more in than we're sending out. And what we'll be able to do is help other countries, which is a good thing. Uh, not only allies, countries that need help. We're talking about a lot of countries that need help. Jared, Mr. President, Mr. President, on the food supply chain, yeah. is there anything your administration is doing or might be doing in the future? to make sure that there's enough um, meat supplies? Should yeah, we're working we with Tyson. Exports we are. Exports we're going to sign an executive order today, I believe. And uh, that'll solve uh, any liability problems where they had certain liability problems. And uh, we'll be in very good shape. We're working with Tyson, which is one of the big companies in that world. And we always work with the farmers. There's plenty of supply. There's plenty of, as you know, there's plenty of supply. It's distribution, and we will uh, 
probably have that today uh, yes, solved. It was a very unique circumstance because of liability. Mr. Yes, President, Mr. President, can, can, you cla right can you clarify what your uh, intelligence advisors were telling you back in January and February? Were you warned about what was happening with coronavirus and the threat to this country? Should there have been well, stronger warnings? No, what, I, what, what were you hearing yeah, every day? Yeah. In your I think probably a brief? lot more than the Democrats because a month later, Nancy Pelosi was saying, let's dance in the streets of Chinatown. You uh, go back and you take a look uh, at even professionals like Anthony were saying, this is no problem. This is late in February. This is no problem. This is going to blow. This is going to blow over. And they're professionals and they're good professionals. Uh, most people thought this was going to blow over, and uh, you can go. We did, I think, on January, uh, toward the end of January, we did a ban with uh, China. That was a very, I, I think you just said a little while ago, that was a very important step. And then ultimately, we did a ban on Europe. That was very early in the process, because if you take the ban and you look at it, I was badly criticized by Sleepy Joe Biden, by others. I was criticized horribly for, I mean, uh, he called, he said all sorts of things. We won't even say it. And then he apologized because two weeks ago he put out a statement that I was right. So, uh, so we did a ban. Yeah. John, as you know, we did a ban. And many people, Democrats, professionals, probably Republicans, said that this would never happen, that it would be nothing, no big problem. You saw that, I think, better than anybody, Deborah. This was after the ban. So obviously I took it very serious. I'm not going to be banning China from coming in if I didn't take it seriously, and I did that early. But, but, but so, 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 so were you, were you getting warnings uh, in your presidential well, I'd have to check. I would have to check. I want to look as to the exact dates of warnings. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I can tell you this. When I did the ban on China, almost everybody was against me, including Republicans. They thought it was far too harsh, that it wasn't necessary. Professionals, Republicans, and Democrats, almost everybody disagreed. And that was done very early. And, and that was a big step, because I think we saved, whether it was luck, talent, or something else, we saved many thousands of lives. And Anthony said that, and you were saying that, and a lot of people said it was a very, I think you'd have a much different situation right now if we didn't do the ban. On, on that, you know, we also did a ban, as you know, earlier. We did a ban on Europe yeah, March, sometime right? after, but still relatively early. Now, now after the ban on traveled from China, 40,000 people came into the United States. Those were American citizens, largely. In hindsight, I'm looking back, should there have been steps made to quarantine those people that were coming back or to test well, there them? Were, we, in Florida, we, we had hundreds of people that were under investigation by our health department. They were, they were asked to quarantine for 14 days. Anyone that was coming back from China, the Wuhan area and Hubei province, they were having to self-isolate before they could even get to Florida because that's what you guys did. Right. But we had uh, all hundreds of people under investigation during this time, and actually none of them ended up testing positive, the ones that developed symptoms. Uh, I don't think a lot of them didn't develop symptoms, but that was actually being done in Florida, and we were very much viewing it as a China China deal, of course. I think it was, you know, what, what it, New York eventually brought it to Florida, but, but that was being done in the state level. And the people we let back, John, as you know, they were American citizens. What are you gonna do? You can't come back into your country. You know, we had, it wasn't like we were thrilled either. I said, well, we have these people coming back, all American citizens, meaning just about all American citizens. There's not much you can do about that. That's now, right, we did do testing, in hindsight, would and you individual, well, in hindsight, the states did testing. I know Ron was doing a lot of testing, mm -hmm. and the individual states were doing, in cooperation with the federal government. But originally, it was that, oh, 40,000 people came in. What they don't say, what the news doesn't say, is they happen to be American citizens. How do you keep American citizens? You say they're coming in from China. They want to come back to their country. There's a tremendous problem in China. They want to come back. Are we supposed to say to an American citizen, you can't come back into your country? And we did do testing, and individual states did testing, or were supposed to have. Uh, anybody else? Yes. There's some more details on the executive order regarding the meat supply. So it seems like the issue right now is that with the processing plants closed down, there are all these animals, but they can't be processed into meat to hit American yeah, supermarkets. We're handling it probably today. We'll have that. Uh, that uh, it's a roadblock. Uh, it's sort of a legal roadblock more than anything else. We'll have that done today. You could speak to the chief in a little while if you'd like, okay? They'll give you a specific. I, I don't know if you'd like that because there won't be any cameras running. But if you'd like to get a real answer, you could speak to the chief. Yeah, and JetBlue today was the first airline to mandate that passengers wear masks on planes. Is that something that you are considering rolling out for all who, who flights? Did it? Who did JetBlue. It? Yeah. Sounds like a good idea. Governor, to me, sounds like a very governor, good idea. Governor, you, you have hundreds of thousands of 
tourists and visitors coming from Canada each year, spending months in Not your right state. now we don't, but normally no, exactly. we do. exactly. Have you been able to evaluate how much your, your, the economy of your state is losing from the borders being closed? And what do you think, what's your feeling about things going back to something normal as for the visitors coming from Canada? So I think that a lot of this is a, a confidence and building confidence with the public that the next step is going to be done thoughtfully, it's going to be done in a measured way, and it's going to be done uh, with an eye to making sure that we're not pretending that this virus just doesn't exist. I mean, we, we have to make safety a priority. Um, I will say, though, that I do think there's a path to do that. If you look at Florida's outbreak, just think of all the people that were in Florida, January, February, all, I mean, Disney was going all the way till mid-March. Um, we didn't have outbreaks tied to a lot of that stuff for whatever reason. Maybe it's because most of our activities are outdoors and I think it's probably not as an efficient vector when you're outside in the sun as compared to close contact indoors. But um, and, and all these different people in these industries, part of my task force, and this isn't gonna happen overnight, but they're all thinking about innovative ways to be able to do, do different things and do it safely. And we've seen that even on the basic level of, if you go to a, like drive by Home Depot now, they'll be six feet apart waiting to go in the store and then they're doing it. So people are adapting and they're innovating. So I think that that will happen. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. I think we're gonna have to be uh, measured and thoughtful, but I think that as people see that, that, that different things can happen safely, I think the confidence factor will go up. But clearly, financially, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an issue for Florida because anytime people come, they end up paying tax on that. I mean, you look at just the theme parks and the amount of, uh, of, the, of the tax that they contribute to the state. Now, fortunately, we had billions of dollars in reserve, but even with that, you are facing a hit. There's just no doubt about it. I think the fourth quarter is going to be really strong, and I think next year is going to be a tremendous year. Uh, that's what's building. That's my opinion. Uh, third quarter is a transition quarter. Uh, second quarter is what it is, but the, uh, I mean, we're, we're in this period where, let's see what the numbers are. Uh, third quarter is a uh, transition. I think fourth quarter is going to be incredibly strong. I think next year is going to be an unbelievably strong year. Uh, Kevin and Larry, would you like to say something about that? Why don't you start with the CBO numbers, sir? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, look, um, we know we're in a deep contraction with rising unemployment. It's a lot of hardships, a lot of difficulty. The President's rescue package, which really totals $9 trillion between the Treasury and the Fed, has helped to cushion that blow. So that's point number one. We'll take the hit. It's very bad, very difficult. We're doing what we can. As the Governor said, as confidence returns with safety features and data-driven, people are anxious to go back to work. And it's interesting to me the Congressional Budget Office as well as Wall Street Journal survey of economists, both predicting very significant pickups and growth in the second half of the year, almost 20% uh, growth increases. So that's a good sign. And the President has commissioned us to study uh, middle class tax relief, middle class regulatory relief, infrastructure uh, developments, um, insurance uh, liability protections for small businesses, and again, middle class, I think people are anxious to go to work. There's going to be a lot of pent-up demand. And so I am optimistic about the future. This current situation, as my great friend and colleague Kevin has said, right in here, it is going to be the worst we've seen probably. But nonetheless, that will be temporary. I believe it passes. And that's what some of these surveys are telling us. And Larry, I wanted a payroll tax cut. I thought that yes, would have been did. the best thing, but the Democrats did not want to give it to us, so we went a different way, uh, which is fine, but I wanted a payroll tax both cut. Of, so both, of us, both of us agreed with yeah, you no, with that. I think, they, I think they should have done a payroll tax cut. So Democrats did not want a payroll tax cut, and I think that's a mistake. Mr. President, um, Congress comes back next week. Let me try to ferret out the elephant in the room here, potentially, if there is an elephant in the room. What about the idea of aid to states? And Governor, what do you think of this idea from Capitol Hill, from Washington sending money to individual states who may be suffering severely through lost revenues and picking up a lot of the tab here? I think there's a big difference with a state that lost money because of COVID and a state that's been run very badly for 25 years. There's a big difference in my opinion. And uh, you know, we'd have to talk about things like payroll tax cuts. We'd have to talk about things like 
sanctuary cities, as an example. I think sanctuary cities is something has to be brought up, where uh, people that are criminals are protected. They're protected from prosecution. I think that has to be done. I think it's one of the problems that the states have. I don't even think they know they have a problem, but they have a big problem with it, the sanctuary city situation. Uh, we'd have to talk about a lot of different things, but uh, we're certainly open to talking, but it would really have to be COVID-related, not related for mismanagement over a long time, over a long period of time. You're willing to make that distinction, that much of a distinction? <laughs> well, it's a very, you can only imagine very simple distinction to make, yeah. We're not looking to do a bailout for a state that's been unfair to — it's unfair to many of the states, most of the states that have done such a good job, okay? Anything else? Thank you for the question. Do you have any message? Mr. Follow up to something you mentioned yesterday, sir. A follow up to a question from yesterday. Yeah. Um, you spoke about having a sense of what's going on with Kim Jong un. Can you say whether or not he's in control of his country? I just don't want to comment on it. I don't want to comment on it. I just wish him well. I don't want to comment on it. I just want to ask you uh, I'm sure you saw that Congress was supposed to come back uh, next week. Steny Hoyer has just announced that the House will not come back, given that D.C. has a state, still has a stay-at-home order. Is that a good move, wise move, or a bad move? What the you Democrats, they don't want to come back. They don't want to come back. I think they should be back here, but they don't. They're enjoying their vacation. And they shouldn't think be. they're enjoying this time. Vacation? Yeah, I think they are. I think they are. If you, you look at Nancy Pelosi eating ice cream on late-night television, yeah, I think they probably are. They're having a good time. Uh, I think they should be back. I think they should all come back and we should work on this together. Thank you very much, everybody. Right, let's go. Come on, Brad, let's go this way. Get up this way. Come on, Hunter, let's go. No, no worries. No, Come on, Brad, let's go. You've been listening to President Trump alongside his economic advisors there talking about the economy. I want to take you now live to New York, where Governor Andrew I'll Cuomo is giving us an update as well on Corona much, crisis. Much better than the other states in how many people haven't been able to sign up. We have over 1,000 people working on phones and technology. It's even more now, right? 3,000 now. 3,000 people hired just to man phones and the website, et cetera. So we have the number down dramatically, but it was just a sheer function of quantity and volume. Now, good news, bad news. Yes, it's frustrating. We hear the discussion every day, well, some states are reopening because they don't have that bad a problem. Some of the places in upstate have a problem that's comparable to states in the Midwest or the West. Much, much different than New York City. Okay, then let's come up with data points, factual points of what we have to do to reopen uh, so everyone has the same uh, opening template that we're dealing with. And we have to be smart about this. Again, I know it's emotion, and I know people are feeling emotional, but emotions can't drive a reopening process, right? We're talking about infection rates. We're talking about hospital capacity. Separate the emotion from the logic, and we have to act as our logical selves here. And that's what smart means. Be smart about it. Don't be emotional, don't be political, don't get pushed politically into a situation. Uh, protesters are in front of the Capitol, we better reopen. No, I'm not gonna do that. That's not how we make decisions. The first point is CDC set guidelines as to reopening for states. We think those CDC guidelines make sense, which is you have to have a 14-day decline in the number of hospitalizations before you go forward. Second, identify industries that you can start reopening that will bring people back to work, get the economy going, but you know you can do the appropriate precautions and social distancing. So in phase one, we're talking about the construction and manufacturing industry, right? Those are two industries that employ a lot of people, but uh, we believe you can put the right precautions in place and learn the lessons from where we uh, have been. And say to those businesses, this is not a, just about government, say to the businesses, 
tell us how you are going to incorporate the lessons that we just learned. How do you incorporate social distancing? How do you incorporate fewer people in the space so you reduce density? How do you have the right PPE? How are you going to monitor? Are you going to take temperatures of everyone who walks in? That's for businesses uh, to decide also. Separate point, make sure you don't have what we call attractive nuisance, nuisances, not really the right use of the term. Attractive nuisance is a legal term. Uh, but an attractive nuisance in this context, you open up a facility or an attraction that could bring people from outside the region to you. Uh, you have all this pent up demand in the whole tri-state region. Make sure you don't open up something that's going to bring hundreds of people from the outside in. Uh, what business precautions will those individual businesses take? Watch the healthcare capacity. Your healthcare system cannot go over 70% capacity. Again, there's a two week lag. If you're at 70%, bells should go off. Don't go over 70% in your ICU beds. Many of the people who come in with COVID need an ICU bed because it's a respiratory illness. Uh, as a matter of fact, almost uh, at the heat of this, almost every bed in a hospital turned into an ICU bed. That's why we needed the ventilators, because these people who get seriously ill with COVID need that level of care. Remember, you have a flu season coming up in the fall. And the number of hospitalizations normally goes up in the flu season. So anticipate that. Stockpile the equipment. We learned a lot of painful lessons here. One is you have to have the PPE, you have to have the masks, you have to have the gown. There's an international demand on it. So make sure we have a stockpile or reserve of the PPE. We have to have testing. How many tests? Dr. Burks recommends 30 per 1,000 people. Different people different, uh, have different numerical percentages. Uh, but I think we start with that. Do we have enough testing sites? How long does it take to turn around the test? And then are we advertising to people, this is where you go and this is what you do to get a test if you think you may be infected? The whole thing with keeping that infection rate down is find a person early who is infected, let them know it, and then trace and then isolate. Do we have a tracing system in place? Mayor Bloomberg is helping us organize this. It's never been done before. Uh, nobody ever heard of tracing to this extent. But tracing is, once a person says they're positive, you trace their contacts back, you notify people, you test people, that's a whole different op uh, operation. Uh, the current recommendation is you need at least 30 tracers per 100,000 people. So we have to have that in place. You have to have isolation facilities in place. Uh, isolation facilities are when someone gets sick, you know they're positive, and uh, they don't want to go home to quarantine because if they go home, they could infect their family, which is what's happening now, a lot of these new cases. Uh, so we have to have a facility where somebody who is positive can quarantine for the two weeks without going home. And we have to identify them now. We have to coordinate regionally, the schools, transportation net network, testing, tracing. This all has to be coordinated on a multi-county effort. Uh, we have to reimagine telemedicine, reimagine teleeducation. Uh, we have to have a regional control room that is monitoring all these indicators and gives us the danger sign if we get over 70% capacity, if the infection rate pops up. We have to have one central source that's monitoring all these dials that hits the danger button so you could actually slow down the reopening. And then we have to protect and respect essential workers, which I'll talk about in a moment. On businesses, they have to have social distancing, continued testing, ongoing monitoring protocols. That's all part of the new normal, and businesses are going to have to do that if they want to reopen. Uh, they're going to have to adopt the federal and the state guidelines on this issue. Uh, today, we're announcing a, uh, an advisory board 
that is made up of statewide business leaders, academic leaders, civic leaders, who's advising us on just this, and they have been for weeks, and I want to thank them very much. Uh, manufacturing construction as the first phase businesses, that's 46,000 jobs in a place like central New York, so it's a major employer. And these are businesses that can adopt to the new normal in terms of the, their employees, in terms of the places of business, and in terms of the processes that they put in place. On the healthcare capacity, again, we just lived this. Uh, we cannot be in a situation where 70% uh, capacity uh, is exceeded. You need at least that 30% buffer on hospital beds, uh, and you need 30% of your ICU beds available if that number starts to tick up. Uh, in terms of testing, we have to have the testing regimen in place, and we have to prioritize the people who get tested. Uh, symptomatic people, individuals who came in contact with a symptom, Thematic person and frontline and essential workers. They do have a higher rate of infection because they're putting themselves in harm's way and we want to make sure they have the testing uh, so we have an early alert system. You have to have the right number of sites. Testing won't work if it's impossible to get. Testing won't work if it's too hard to get. Uh, so you have to have the right number of sites for the area that you're dealing with. Uh, the advertising is very important. It has to be available, but people have to know it's available, and they have to know what the symptoms are uh, that would have them go get tested. Because again, this is about people understanding it and people buying into it. This is not government orders. This is people get it, they know the facts, they know what they're supposed to do, and they do it because they have been, uh, we've communicated successfully the circumstances and the facts. Uh, but you need that testing and you need it to trace the contacts, otherwise you see that infection rate increase. On the tracing, the estimate is 30 tracers for every 100,000 people. So that's a data point, that's what it means to have tracing in place. And then isolation facilities uh, is a proportionate number of people who test positive, who say, I can't go home, or I don't want to go home. I don't want to infect my family. I don't want to infect my significant other. I have enough issues without having to explain how I infected my significant other with COVID, which is a valid point. Uh, so isolation facilities available for those people. And then the regional control room where you're monitoring all of those metrics, you're monitoring hospital capacity, the rate of infection, the PPE burn rate, uh, how businesses are complying, and uh, it has an emergency switch that we can throw if any one of those indicators are problematic. Because remember, we have gone through hell and back over the past 60 or so days. Uh, what we've done has been tremendous really tremendous. And uh, what people have done, what the American people have done, what New Yorkers have done, has been to save lives, literally. But we have to re remain vigilant. This is not over. I know as much as we want it to be over, it's not over. Uh, and we have to respect what we accomplished here. When they started this, the projections for this state were 100 and 20,000 New Yorkers would be infected and hospitalized. Only 20,000 were infected and hospitalized. How could they be so wrong? They weren't wrong. We changed reality. The differential, the variance, is what we did. It's the close down, it's wearing masks, it's all of that. We reduced the rate. We so-called flattened the curve, flattened the curve. Uh, well, that meant 100,000 fewer New Yorkers didn't get seriously ill, didn't go into a hospital, didn't overwhelm the hospital system, uh, and a percentage of those people who got seriously ill would have passed away. So we literally saved lives. We can't now negate everything that we accomplished. We have to do the opposite. We have to take this experience 
And we have to learn and grow from the experience. And we have to build back better than before. As a society and as a community, we need better systems. This exposed a lot of issues, fundamental issues. We have to do a better job on teleeducation, remote learning. Sounds great. But you have to have all the equipment. People have to be trained, and teachers have to be trained. We jumped into it. We have to do a better job. We have to do a better job on telemedicine. Not everybody has to show up at the doctor's office. You can do a better job. We have to do a better job on our basic public health system. I mean, when you look back, the virus was in China last November and December. Last November and December. Why didn't someone suspect, well, maybe the virus gets on a plane last November, December, and lands in the United States the next day? Right? Everybody talks about global interconnection and how fast you're going to. Everybody knows there's a, a virus in China last November, December. China says, don't worry, we're taking care of it. Yeah, but all you need is one person to get on a plane. As it happened, one person got on a plane and went from China to Europe, and then it went from Europe to New York. The flights from China basically go to the West Coast. The flights from Europe basically go to the East Coast. We got it through Europe. But where was the whole international health community? Where was the whole national host of experts, the WHO, the NIH, the CDC, that whole alphabet soup of agencies? Where was everyone? Where, were the, where was the intelligence community with the briefings saying this is in China? And they have something called an airplane. And you can get on an airplane, and you can come to the United States. Governors don't do global pandemics, right? Uh, but there's a whole international, national health community would do that. Where are all the experts? Where was the New York Times? Where was the Wall Street Journal? Where was all the bugle blowers who should say, be careful. There's a virus in China that may be in the United States. That was November, December. We're sitting here, January, February, still debating uh, how serious this is. And again, it's not a state responsibility. But in this system, who was supposed to blow the bugle and didn't? Because I would bank that this happens again and is the same thing going to happen again? I hope not. So we have to figure these things out. We also have to remember that as a society and as a community, we're about government and we're about systems. But even more, we are about values. What makes us who we are are our values. Uh, and that's my last point, which is point number 12, protect and respect the essential workers. I had two nightmares when this started. One, that I would put out directives on what we need to do, and 19 million New Yorkers would say, I haven't been convinced. I'm not going to do this. Just look at what the directives were. Given by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. We've got a lot of other news we want to get you caught up on. We're going to take a short break, and I hope you'll join us back for the rest of the day's news. You're streaming CBS app. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. 
doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Sinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water,